This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. What's going on, everybody? Yes, we're going to be co covering Edmund Kemper tonight, the whack job barbarian serial killer. All right, but uh, at the same time, if you know about him, just keep everything to yourself because we're going over it from the beginning, and I don't want you to step on it. I've already gone over this fifty thousand times, so if you're just showing up, don't. Keep jump ahead and say, oh yeah, this is what he did, this is what he did, okay? Let's just try to go through it in normal time, okay? Because I do it differently here. We go through the newspaper articles and, uh, you know, how it was back then. Oh, now, here we go with the zip lips. That means, ooh, I, I know everything, so I'm going to not have to say everybody, but know that I'm the expert because I put the zip lips. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, by the way, I called up... Um, uh, Tim Miller today, you know, just to say, hey, what's, you know, how, you know, congratulations type of thing. And they they were out looking for the clothing just to squash all the rumors that people have, right? Because they know what really just that he got lost out there, dehydrated, still in the hospital, everything. Um, Ramirez, that's who I'm talking about. So it's pretty interesting that he's out there, you know, they're looking for the clothing. Yeah. Now yeah, it's cool that they're out there doing that. Yeah, just to try to make sure that there isn't any of these crazy rumor mill stuff going around. Because if they don't find the clothing, it'll just continue on and on and on and on and on. You know how people are, right? All right. So we're getting ready to begin here. So if you're experts, just don't say anything and let everybody else who isn't an expert will just go through it in the order that it happened back then in 19... Well, it started in 1964, I think. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let me get to the right screen here. <laughs> get everything but that. All right, so we're gonna go back in time. Yeah, everybody knows what he looks like, right? Let me. Uh... Here, I'll just show you this one picture really quick. He's a really tall guy, six nine. You know, two hundred eighty pounds. This is it. Him at one of his locations where he buried somebody. But there you go. That's that's what he looks like. There's a lot of videos on YouTube. I have a lot of them where he's being interrogated, so we can go over that later. But, uh, hold on, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna start from the very beginning, and here's the very first article that had his name in it. Because well, believe it or not, he was in the paper nine years prior. And here it is, Edmund Kemper the third. He's actually like Edmund Emil Guy Kemper the third. He said he was angry at the world when he stabbed his grandmother, Miss Edmund Kemper, 66, to death. Uh, and this is in, uh, it's in California as well. Miss Edmund Kemper, 66, to death, uh, Thursday while she was writing a story for Boy's Life magazine and then killed his grandfather to keep him from seeing what he had done. Alright, so this is 1964. That's what's wild, right? So then... 
Uh, another article from August 28th is a little bit longer. So, a 15 year old youth who said he was mad at the world shot and stabbed his grandmother to death while she was writing a story for Boys Life magazine and then killed his grandfather to keep him from seeing what he had done. After the shooting, Edmund Emil Kemper III, who was known as Guy, called his mother, Mrs. Carnell Stanberg, in Helena, Montana, and told her of the shootings. Moderna County Sheriff officers found the body of Edmund Emil Kemper, 72, in the garage of his mountain cabin residence near here. The body of his wife, Maud, 66, was found in the bedroom of the home. A young Kemper told sheriff's officers he was sitting in the patio at the home when he suddenly decided to shoot his grandmother, who was inside the house typing the final transcript of an adventure story. So you notice there's nothing to do with the mom here. It's just, you know, it's his mom or anything like that. He's just like, hey, I think I'm going to shoot somebody. Fifteen minutes later, Kemper returned from a shopping trip. So this is the grandfather. So it says um, he was typing the final transcript of, of an adventure story for Boy's Life, the magazine. Fifteen minutes later, Kemper returned from a shopping trip to North Fork and was met at the side of the house by his grandson. Granddad was smiling at me, young Kemper said. When he turned, I placed the rifle this far, indicating, uh, you know, he's drawing something. Hey, thanks, D. Lambo. I don't know if I have the, is that gonna work if I turn that on right now? Is it gonna get that? I'll keep it off in general, but. Well, thank you very much. Very kind. It's a cat eye donation, so thank you. Oh, I did catch it. <laughs> I just wanted to get that one turned on. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Wait, hold on. All right, so let's go back up there. It said, um, so he shot his grandmother, and then 15 minutes later, Kemper returned from the, uh, let me turn, off, turn that off. He returned from a shopping trip in North Fork and was met at the side of the house by his grandson. Granddad was smiling at me, young Kemper said. When he turned, I placed the rifle, and he's showing, indicating 30 inches, so he stuck his arms out and, you know, from the back of his head and shot him. The only reason he gave of officers for the shooting was that he was mad at the world, didn't want to return to Southern California, where his father, Edmund Emil Kemper Jr., 45, lives in Van Nuyen, and didn't want to stay in North Fork. Actually, if they, uh, this is like in Montana, isn't it? Now that I think about it, let me think. Yeah, I think it's in Montana, actually, is where that took place. If I remember correctly, I, I mean, it might be in one of the other articles. Is there a North Fork, California? Hold on, let me just check one thing. I'm going to look at the wiki article on that really fast. It's a pretty good Wikipedia. I'm going to use it for, like, the conclusion of certain parts. Uh, let's see, where was that? No, nah, that was actually California. So. Unless he was just visiting. Hold on. He was kept at uh, a youth facility in California, so it must be where it took place. Yeah, he's got to be the tallest serial killer. Who would be a serial killer at 6'9"? Hey, everybody, I'm right here. So, basically, the only reason he gave officers for shooting was that he was mad at the world, didn't want to return to Southern California, where his father, Edmund 
Emil Kemper Jr. 45 lived in Van Nuys and didn't want to stay in North Fork. Okay, so I mean, he's already a psycho kid. And they put him in a facility, and of course, you know, we know how those all work. They're so amazing how they transform people. Sheriff deputies booked a 15-year-old boy yesterday for the double killing of his grandparents, a crime inspired apparently by the fact that he was upset and mad at the world. The boy is Edmund Emil Guy Kemper III, who stands six foot four, so he's six foot four at 15. Despite his youth and weighs 160 pounds, Chief Deputy William Helms described him as seemingly above average in intelligence. His victims were Mr. and Mrs. Edmund Emil Kemper, residents of a small Sierra foothill community <coughs> called North Fork, so it's in California. About 45 miles east of here, Kemper, 72, was a retired division of highway electrician. His wife, Maude, was 66. Helms said the youth shot his grandmother in the back of the head once, twice in the, let's see, in the head once, and then twice in the back, then stabbed her twice with a 10-inch kitchen knife. A little later, the officer said, the grandfather returned to the house from a shopping trip in a pickup truck. The boy, Helm said, told us the grandfather smiled a greeting as he climbed down. Then he shot him in the back of the head when he turned to lift out some packages. Wow. He said he didn't want his grandfather to see what he had done as to why he stabbed his grandmother after shooting her. The boy said he didn't think she was dead and didn't want her to suffer. Right, so he says he stabbed her so she wouldn't suffer. Why not shoot her again? He said he dragged Kemper's body into the garage so passers wouldn't see it. Um, he had already dragged Mrs. Kemper's body into the bedroom from the living room and had hidden the knife in the bedroom closet. He shot his grandmother as she was sitting at her typewriter desk where she was finishing the final draft of an adventure story for a boy's magazine. In questioning him thus far, we haven't pinpointed any kind of reasonable motive. He just indicated he was upset, mad at the world, and that he was unhappy both about staying with his grandparents or going back to his father, W.E. Kemper II, who lives in Van Nuys. Uh, let's see, phoned his mother. The first information about the killings reached the sheriff's office when the boy's divorced mother, Mrs. Clarnell Kemper, telephoned from Helena, Montana. She said her, that's, that's the Montana reference. Uh, she said her son had just called her and revealed that he what he had done. While deputies were en route to North Fork, the boy called the sheriff himself and repeated the story. He is being held in the Moderna, Madura Juvenile Detention Home. He told officers he had been in trouble only once before a car theft charge on which he had been placed on informal probation. Yeah. And then he gets sentenced here. Just got to open that one up. Hope you guys don't mind the way I'm doing it here. This is just kind of the, the order of, you know, I, I probably, I'm not going to bring up every little detail that things were written about in a book. I'm doing this out of the papers at the time, okay? And I am going to use Wiki, Wikipedia's um, just to sort of polish off different segments. You know, because they have like pretty good uh, just uh, summaries of different things all right so the boy 15 sentenced to CYA and that's the California youth uh, I just saw it a minute ago maybe it'll say it in here Edmund Emil Kemper the third 15 who admitted killing his grandparents last month because he was mad at the world was sentenced to the California Youth Authority today for indefinite term Juvenile court judge Mason Bailey handed down the sentence but declined to give the results of psychiatric examinations which he ordered for the boy early this month. Kemper admitted fire now this is where you kind of know who this guy really is here. Look. Kemper admitted firing three shots into his grandmother, Miss Maud Kemper, 66, at a cabin 
near North Fork, August 27. He said he shot his grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper, 72, later, to keep him from learning of Miss Kemper's death. Like, he didn't want him to suffer the pain of knowing that she died. That's what he claims. The only reason the youth gave at the time of the shooting was that he was mad at the world and did not want to continue living with his grandparents. Miss Clarnell Strandberg of Helena, Montana, the boy's mother, and Edmund Emil Kemper Jr. of Van Nuys, his father, are divorced. The boy will be sent to California Youth, Youth Authority Perkins Reception Center at Sacramento, where it will be cited, to which CYA facility he will be sent. Okay, now, a portion out of Wikipedia that concludes this part that wasn't in the paper. They didn't put in, like, his release date or anything like that in the paper. So here's the segment out of there that I thought was in. When, when Kemper's grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper, returned from grocery shopping, Kemper went outside and fatally shot him in the driveway next to his car. Uh, so he phoned his mother, who told him to contact the local police. Kemper called police and waited to be taken into custody. After his arrest, Kemper said that he just wanted to see what it, what it felt like. See, this is the reality of it. I actually saw another interview with a person just like this. After his arrest, Kemper said that he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill Grandma. That was the only reason he gave. He wasn't mad at the world. He just wanted to see what it felt like. And testified that he killed his grandfather so he would not have to find out that his wife... Uh, that his wife, angry with Kemper for what he, you know, he didn't want him to be angry at him for what he did to his wife. Psychiatrist Donald Lunday, who interviewed Kemper during adulthood, wrote, in his way, he had a, avenged the rejection of both his, of Kemper's crimes were deemed incomprehensible for a 15-year-old to commit, and court psychiatrists diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic then sent him to Atascadero Security Facility that houses mentally ill convicts. And at that location, psychiatrists and social workers disagreed with the court psychiatrist's diagnosis. Their report stated that Kemper um, showed... Let me zoom out. That Kemper showed no flight... Uh, no flight of ideas, no interference with thought, no expression of delusion or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. And see, this makes him one of those scary types, right? Because he, when he, even when you listen to his interviews, he doesn't sound crazy when, he, when he's talking. But the topic is, you know, like, they also observed him to be intelligent and introspective. Initial testing measured his IQ at 136 over two standard deviations above average. He was re-diagnosed with less severe condition, a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. Later on in his time at that facility, Kemper was given another IQ test, which gave a higher result of 145. Kemper endeared himself to the psychiatrist by being a model prisoner and was trained to administer psychiatric tests to other inmates. I mean, can you believe this yet? Uh, one of the psychiatrists later said, he was a very, he was a very, and this is not typical of a sociopath. I don't know why, oh wait, yeah, excuse me. He was a very good worker, and that's not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work. Kemper also became a member of the JCs while in the facility and said, he developed some new tests and some new scales on the Minnesota multi-phasic personality inventory. Wow. So he, he's, he's in there and he's helping them build new systems to test people. Specifically on overt hostility scale. During his work with the, the facility, after his second arrest, Kemper said that being able to understand how these tests function allowed him to manipulate his psychiatrist so he just yeah this guy he's not he's not crazy that's the thing you guys see people think oh yeah yeah you got to be crazy no no he's not even wired different. he's just a an evil psycho right like he is 
Some of these people just don't give a shit, right? I mean, everybody wants to have an answer. Like, well, if we get in there and we figure out what, you know. No. All right, so now we're going to move on to... And we're moving to 1972 now. Okay, the first article was May 15th, 1972. Co-ed's missing. A Southern California man is appealing for aid from anyone who may have seen two teenage co-eds from Fresno State College who disappeared in the Bay Area more than a week ago. Marianne Pesky, I think that's how you pronounce it, and Anita M. Luchessa, roommates at Fresno State, were last seen May 7th as they hitchhiked on Ashby Avenue. So this, is, this article is a week, eight days later. So they were hitchhiking on Ashby Avenue in Berkeley. And I think uh, I have that general location. It didn't give a specific, uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is Ashby Avenue and it kind of goes for a while. So I don't know exactly where, you know, it's hard to say for sure, but that's the, that's the avenue right there. And I guess they were just hitchhiking a ride somewhere, somewhere along here. Uh, they were visiting friends in Berkeley, he said, then tried to get a, a ride to Stanford when they disappeared. So far, Berkeley police have found no trace of either teenager. Blue-eyed Miss Pesky um, is five foot one, with brown hair, cut in a shag style, she was wearing a maroon colored sweater, faded blue jeans, and hiking boots. She was carrying an orange colored backpack. Miss Luchessa is also five foot one with long brown hair and brown eyes. She was wearing a red skirt under white bib type overalls. She was also carrying a knapsack and may have had sleeping bag. Anyone who has any permission to call a number. But so this is how it was in the paper back then. And I actually have both of them. Let me show you the pictures of them so you, you can just have it in your mind. So that would be uh, Luchessa. And then this one, I'll make that bigger, hold on. So these are the two uh, roommates that went hitchhiking and disappeared right there. This is Luchessa Pesky right there. And we'll move on to the next one. Four days later. Two missing Fresno State College co-eds are believed to be in the Santa Cruz area after disappearing in the San Francisco Bay area at the first of the month. They are Anita Luchessa and Marianne Pesky. Miss Luchessa is five foot one with long brown hair, brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a red skirt. And anyone, you know, so again, it's pretty much the same thing. Just four days later, they're just gone. And then we've got another one uh, about three days later in the paper. Most of these will probably be pretty similar. Two Fresno State College co-eds or roommates who disappeared while hitchhiking in Berkeley May 7th are being sought by the father of one who is, has a private detective on the trail. The two girls are Mary Ann Pesky and Anita M. Luchessa. They were last seen hitchhiking on Ashby Avenue in Berkeley after visiting friends there and were headed to Stanford University. Uh, let's see. $50 reward, man. That's nothing. Jeez. Hey, thanks, Jay Case. He said, Husey and the Freaks. Camper was born before my time, but talk about a home, a hometown case. <laughs> yeah. Word. That's yeah, good to see you, Jay. All right. So then it skips forward about five weeks. 
And this is just some article. Let me see if there's anything different in it. Uh, the parents of two teenage co-eds from Fresno State College are appealing for aid for anyone that may have seen their daughters. Anita M. Lucessa and Marianne Pesky, roommates of Fresno State, were last seen May 7th as they hitchhiked on Ashby Avenue in Berkeley. They were visiting friends in Berkeley, then tried to get a ride to San Francisco Menlo Park and Stanford University. They were possibly to return to Fresno down the coast highway through Big Sur. All police and private agencies have found no trace of either teenager. Miss Lucessa is five foot one. And this is like, I think, a, probably even a paid for ad here. So I don't, I'm not going to go through their details. But now there's a $500 reward for the location of the girls, which back then was probably like 5000 or something. <clears throat> All right, so that was July 1st, and then August 16th. Yeah, so now we have head found in Coast Ravine. Union City Police were investigating the possibility today that a human head found in Santa Cruz County might be that of a boy whose decapitated body was dug up near the Nimitz Freeway August 5th. The head, that of a youth between 15 and 20 years old, who had been dead about six weeks, was discovered by a pair of target shooters in a ravine in Mount Bachi area. Let's see where that area is. Hold on. Just to get a... Mount Bachi? Right. No, I don't think I spelled it right. Hold on. Mount Batchy area near Santa Clara. Hmm. Mount Batchy, Santa Clara. I don't think it's still there. It might have changed that name. Yeah, I don't think it's still there. How about just Santa Clara? Oh, that's way down here. Okay, but that's in between. That's interesting. See, because Kemper lives right here. I actually have the address of his house where he lived. I mean, I don't know who the hell would want to buy that place after that, but yeah. So Santa Clara is right in between where the abduction was or picking up as a hitchhiker and then where he lives. Uh, Mario W. Bill Oliver, one of the victims attributed to a man now held in Wyoming, was believed to have been slain June 27th, the day he was reported missing by his parents. The body was found after Weldon Mead Kennedy, 29, uh, an ex-convict, allegedly confessed in Wyoming to having murdered him and Vicki Lynn Island 14, whose body was found August 2nd in Union City. So that's when the body was, was found. And they thought, it, you know, maybe it was a boy, boy's head. And then human head identified as a woman's head. A, a human head found in Santa Cruz Mountains has been identified as that of a female. Although I don't know if it's, the, it seems like it's the same one, but anyways. The, the other one said Santa Clara somewhere, but it sounds, no, there it is, Mount Batchy. That's why I couldn't find it. They spelled it wrong. So it's the same one, Mount, there it is, Mount Batchy, there you go. Okay, that's even closer, that's like right on the way over, up in the hills of his, by his house. Interesting. So we'll just put a pin right here, and you know, just generally in this area. So first they thought it was a boy's skull, and it turns out it was a, a woman's skull. Yeah, 
Yeah. So it says a human head found on Santa Cruz Mountains had been identified. Okay, you're saying Highland Way? Uh, let's see. Yeah, well, it's almost exactly where I put the pin, but yeah. All right. So somewhere around in here, we'll say. There we go. Thank you. The head was discovered last August 15th by two San Jose men who were target shooting near Mount Bachi. It was originally thought that the head was that of a young male. Positive sex identification was made through special study of the head by William H. Barkby, physical anthropologist at the University of Arizona. Barkby also said the head had been removed from the body prior to it being discarded and the victim was between 15 and 25 years of age. Thanks, Miss Katya. Okay, then about a week later, nine days later, dental work identifies girl's head. A girl's head found six weeks ago in a remote mountain area in Santa Cruz County was identified Saturday as that of Mary Ann Pesky, 19, of Camarillo. The body has not been found. The Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office said identification was made by comparing the dental work of the head with the charts of Miss Pesky, who was last seen in May in Berkeley with a girlfriend, Anita Lucessa. The Pesky dental charts were checked with the Sheriff's Department by a Modesto private detective, Bob Heitman, who had been hired to find Miss Pesky. She was a student at Fresno State College when she vanished. So it's now, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, but this is, these, this is the first incident here. So now it's just, wow, so what's going on? Uh, we've got a murder, but, you know, nothing, there's no other incidents. But you would probably assume at that point that both girls are not alive at that point. And then uh, two days later, it says, a human head found in an auto-wrecking dump grounds a month ago has been identified as that of missing Camarillo woman. The Santa Cruz County Coroner's Office said today, the coroner's office said the head was that of Mary Ann Pesky, 19, who was reported missing while hitchhiking. Her body had not been found, not found. still missing is another woman, Anita Lucessa, who was with Miss Pesky at the time. The head found by hikers was identified through dental examination. Uh, yeah, it's, this part here has nothing to do with it. <laughs> All right, let me get rid of that one. And then, five days later, and now they're looking for the second individual because now they're not going to be, you know, it's foul play at this point. I mean, if one of them's dead, the other one probably is, right? The Santa Cruz Sheriff Department has released a picture of Mary Ann Pesky, the 19-year-old girl whose severed head was discovered last August in the Santa Cruz Mountains of Loma Prieta. Traveling with Miss Pesky was Anita M. Lucessa, 18, and who is believed by a sheriff's deputy still to be alive. Why? According to press release by the Sheriff's Department, the two girls left Fresno State College with a friend on May 6th at 9 a.m. They went to the University of California in Berkeley and spent the evening with friends. On May 7th, friends drove the girls to 9th and Ashby. Now we can get the exact spot. I didn't have that before, so. Oh, so it's much further down the end there. Right there, now we can literally go right down to the ground and see what it might have kind of looked like. I'm sure it's been, although those buildings look pretty old, you know. So it was right here, just dropped off right here in Ninth and Ashby. This looks, I bet it looked very similar. Look how old these buildings are. They're not anything new. 
That's probably pretty old there. Maybe that's somewhat new, but. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Asher Street in Berkeley, and were led to believe that the girls were going to San Francisco. Both girls had mentioned a desire to go to the Stanford and Menlo Park areas. The girls were observed hitchhiking in Santa Cruz on May 13th. They were seen getting into a blue Pontiac on Ocean Street at Highway 17. So where's that one? Okay, so let's see. Ocean Street and Highway 17. Okay, how about just Ocean Street and then Wow, all the way over here and Highway 17. So that's right there, I just saw 17. So somewhere right around in here, they got into a, uh, maybe you're like right there. So Ocean Street, it seems like two seven, or 17 is the same. I don't know, we'll just put a pin here, but man, that's, now we're getting right near his house. Hmm, that's pretty weird. So I'm just somewhere around in this area. I don't know if it's, it's probably more like uh, right here. I mean, there's 17, was it right there maybe? Yeah. Wild. Both girls had mentioned the desire to go to the Stanford. The girls were observed hitchhiking in Santa Cruz on May 13th. Really? May 13th? That's hard to believe. They were seen getting into a blue Pontiac on Ocean Street at Highway 17. So that means they were just sort of gone for six days? I don't know. And then on Skyline Boulevard in Santa Cruz Mountains, just inside San Mateo County. So there was, what was that? So they were seen getting into a blue Pontiac on Ocean Street at Highway 17. And then on Skyline Boulevard in Santa Cruz. I don't know what you're talking about, Alifair. You're, you're just all over the place. No idea what you're talking about. I'm actually doing a show. I no idea what you're talking about. Um, I don't know if Skyline is still there. Maybe it's Skyline Drive in Santa Cruz. Okay. There we go. Maybe. Yeah. It said Skyline Boulevard. But anyways, I think they went missing on the 7th, so... I'm not sure if I'm buying into that. They're still seen 13 days later. I bet that's false uh, information. Authorities are requesting that anyone knowing the location of Miss Luchessa or, uh, or to call the police, but, you know, that was a long time ago. And it's solved, so we don't need to read that. All right, so at this point, they do have the head of Pesky. They haven't found Luchessa. All right, so now we move on, then just uh, four months later, we have, this one's really uh, bothers me a lot, more than, I don't know why, I just, you know, they're all really bothersome, but this one's, she, this girl was even in the paper prior, okay, so her name is Aiko Ku, so this is just 
per um, Ico Ku dances at Civic Center, Asian American Festival included classic dances and music. So there she is right there. Just, you know, in the paper on August 20th. And then she makes it into the paper again on September 18th, not even a month later. And there she is again in this article, the same picture. Aiko Ku 15, a talented and extremely attractive Korean American dancer, widely known throughout the Bay Area, has disappeared and relatives fear she may have accepted a ride instead of boarding a bus last Thursday. The girl, daughter of Mrs. Uh, Skydrit, uh, Ruben Ku of Berkeley was last seen shortly after 7 p.m. that day talking with another girl at a bus stop at University in Shattuck in Berkeley. So let's do that one. Uh, so it was. Uh, uh, University in Shattuck, Berkeley. There it is. So this one was right here. Yeah, she's very pretty. Sorry for my chair. Gotta get this sucker switched out. Thanks, LM. Yes, and if you guys would like to help support the channel, feel free to do so. We'll be Probably donating another $500 here in the next, I don't know, week or so. And then at the end of the month, we do our bigger push. We've had, uh, we have donated as a channel because of the generosity of all the freaks. Doesn't seem to work, Beholder, so you can mention it all day long. The, uh, we've donated as a channel $34,000 to crime-related charities. All right, so here we go. Shattuck and... Let me put that in there. Thank you, Miss Katya. Okay. Hey, thanks, Janice Johnson. All right. So this is at, uh, she was at a bus stop at University in Shattuck in Berkeley. She was to attend a ballet lesson in San Francisco. Relatives are not certain Miss Ku caught the bus and would like to hear from the girl she talked with at the bus stop. The missing girl who looks several years older than her age attends a girl's school in Oakland and was to leave for the Midwest this month. Hey, thank you. Pebs and Emily Flotilla and Janice Johnson. She was described as being extremely attractive, about five foot four, weighing around 105 pounds with long black hair, either worn straight or tied in a knot. When last seen, she was wearing a black hat with a colorful striped band green sweatshirt, blue denim jacket, blue jeans and brown shoes. This is five days later. Missing girl clues sought. Police are still seeking clues to the disappearance of a 15 year old high school student last seen September 14th at a bus stop waiting for transportation to a San Francisco ballet class. The girl, Aiko Ku, has been described as an extremely attractive Korean American who has danced professionally in several Bay Area performances. Miss Ku, who attends school in Oakland, lived with her mother at 1818, and I'll put that in there, 1818 First Avenue, and that's also in Berkeley. Not, not too far away from right there even. Wow, that's so close. 
to where she probably walked from here to catch that bus, actually. Now that you see that. So that's where she lived, then she probably came out and walked, not far at all. And what, what is that? As a crow flies, we're looking at uh, not even a, I bet you it was 0.4 miles to that bus stop. And then she was waiting here to catch a bus, and apparently, I think, if, I think she might have missed the bus and then accepted a ride from, you know, hitchhiking because she didn't want to miss her ballet lessons. So it was right here in this area. Probably looks like it's been renovated quite a bit here. I'm sure it didn't look like that in 1974. Okay. Miss Koo attends school in Oakland, lived with her parents, her mother, at 1818 Hearst Avenue. Mrs. Koo told police that she had a good relationship with her daughter and had not had any major conflicts. Aiko was to leave later this month for a dance performance in St. Louis. She is described as 5 foot 4, 105 pounds. And there she is. Okay, so there we go. That was just, uh, you know, another person missing at the time. And then we've got... Uh, there, there was a, a few pairs, like a, two pairs and then two individuals. So this is another one of the individuals. Cynthia, Cynthia Ann Shaw... I think that was like a really young picture of her. I don't know. It's strange because like this picture here to me doesn't look much like that picture, but this one's also used to look like her. But man, I don't, I just, I don't see that one. Like I don't see that picture. Maybe somebody mismarked it, but this one was in the paper. All right. So we'll go with that one. All right. So. Cynthia Ann Shaw, 18, has been missing since January 8th. So now we're in, we're actually in 1973 now. Has been missing since January 8th when she left her Santa Cruz home to hitchhike to Cabarillo College. She's 5'5", five 160 five, pounds, and has long blonde hair. Hey, thanks, you're a gypsy. When last seen, she was wearing green, blue, and yellow coat, white blouse, blue Levi's, and green hiking boots. The photo at left is three years old. Okay, so that's probably why that other picture is probably more accurate. And so that's, that first article is on the 19th, so it took a while to get into the paper. Victim of slang from San Rafael. And so this is on the 24th. The last article is the 19th. A San Rafael girl has been identified as the torso murder victim whose dismembered body has washed up in pieces on Santa Cruz and Monterey County beaches in recent days. The murdered girl was Cynthia Ann Shaw, 18, of one, let's see, one, seven, five, Clinton Court. And where is this located? In Santa Cruz? Yeah, I guess it does exist. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. So close to the other victims. Cynthia Shaw, 
show. That's her home. According to, let's see, Miss Shawl had been reported missing from a Santa Cruz home where she was a live in babysitter, so a nanny, or au pair, I guess, while attending Cabrillo College, Santa Cruz Police Lieutenant Charles Shear said. The city police are conducting the murder investigation. The family with whom she lived reported she had last been seen at 5.30 p.m. January 8th when she left the Santa Cruz home to hitchhike to, seven, uh, uh, to a 7.30 p.m. class at the college. So let's see, the family with whom she lived reported they last seen her at 5.30 January 8th when she left Santa Cruz home to hitchhike to a 7.30 class. Shear said investigators were almost positive that the hand and, and headless torso found January 17th at Natural Bridges State Park. So let's see where that is. So she was found in here. I'll just put a random pin. Torso found in here. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Park and a pelvis found Monday on the Santa Cruz beach. Man, this guy's Santa Cruz beach. That's it right there. So pelvic pelvis was found right here, man. Somewhere in this area. I wonder if that just kind of washed up there, like it threw that into the river. I mean, not the river, the ocean that drifted over there. Um, let's see. She said investigators were almost positive that the hand and headless torso found January 17th at Natural Bridges State Park and a pelvis found Monday on the Santa Cruz Beach all, um, all belong to the same victim. However, he said the pathologists would not complete their comparison of the remains until tomorrow. The head, legs, arms, and left hand still were missing today. Investigators speculate the killer used a power saw and knife to dismember the body. Santa Cruz police have no firm leads to the killer's identity or where the murder took place. Ms. Shaw was the daughter of Sue Shaw, uh, McAvoy of San Rafael, and also was survived by a sister, Candace, 17. Yeah, Ms. Shaw was born in San Mateo. She attended high school, let's see, Sleepy Hollow from 1960, 68. Memorial services will be held Saturday noon at Sebastian Church. Yeah. Jeez. Brutal. I always want to hit that save button. Man, <laughs> all that stuff I just did would be gone. A further probe into co ed slang. Homicide investigators were to confer today with pathologists from Monterey County to determine whether pieces of a dismembered body found on beaches in the two counties are those of the same person. Santa Cruz police are positive that a pelvis, torso, and one hand are those of Shaw. So, sounds like it's pretty much the same information. She was re uh, reported missing on January 8th, and this is January 25th, so only about two weeks of time. All right, now we're moving to another 
couple, but I, I don't know. It's I don't know yet if they were the same in the same car together at the same time, or he just picked up two different individuals right after one another. So this is Rosalind Thorpe and Allison Liu. So I haven't got to that part yet. I like to read this as we're going as well, so it's you know interesting to me too. Instead of reading them all, I mean I read little bits so I can just have a clue what's going on, but that's about it. Uh, two UCSC co-ed described as frequent hitchhikers by Santa Cruz police are reported missing in two different cases. So you hear the one common denominator is are that they're all hitchhikers. The first is Alice Lou 20 of 431. So let's do that one. I've already got that one, so. She lived right here. Like back here, I guess, in that house. Pretty cool. Julie Chang, uh, let's see. Her roommate, Julie Chang, reported the woman is missing since Monday. Miss Chang told police that Missing women told her that she was about to hitchhike to campus Monday afternoon and has not returned. Ms. Chang said that the co-ed had never stayed away from the residence all night before. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for the co-ed. She is described as Chinese, wearing bell-bottom blue jeans, a pullover sweater of an unknown color, a gray pea coat, and brown desert boots. Police are also looking for Rosalind Thorpe about 22 years old. I'm not sure when you say about 22, don't you know her age? She lives at uh, 220 Mott Avenue. So that says 220, this says 230. Let me, uh, 220 Mott Avenue. Okay, so that's the same. I think I just wrote it wrong. So that's where Thorpe lived, right there. Wow, what's going on? Come on. Boom. So there you go. That's where she lived, right there. Just cool little bungalows and shit out there. Who was last seen Monday at 7 p.m. heading towards a lecture at UCSC, a friend of Miss Thorpe. Yeah, so what time? That one was at, uh, what was the other one? Hold on. These are, both are lumped together because they went missing on the same day. So let me, let me open this one up again just to get the timing here. I guess they're both mentioned in the same article. Okay, so it was 7 p.m. So what time did she leave? Huh. She was last seen Monday at 7 p.m. heading towards a lecture at UCSC. A friend of Miss Thorpe, Lynn Nakabashi, told police that Miss Thorpe missed the bus to campus and has been known to hitchhike if she misses the bus. Miss Thorpe is 5 foot 6 and has a heavy build according to police. She is white, has long light brown hair, and was wearing black pants, a pea coat, and pink and purple boots. She also wears glasses, police said. Don't you think it's kind of interesting going through it like this? I mean, I'm just, you know, for the newbies out here, I'm kind of low on the... Because it's just sort of like, wow, this, this is how it all played out in the papers, you know? Nobody's putting pieces together at this point. All right, now this is on February 10th, two days later. 
Investigators have failed to turn up clues on the whereabouts of two college co-eds who disappeared while hitchhiking earlier this week. Alice Liu, 21, and Rosalind Thorpe, 23, were students at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Eight murders. So now they're starting to, like, whoa, you know, uh, what's going on here? Both lived on campus in separate apartments. So I don't even know if they knew each other or how that worked, but... Uh, eight murders, including that of a co-ed, have occurred in recent months. And guess what? Some of those murders right there are from a second serial killer that was in the same area at the same time. If you can believe that. Another co-ed is missing and presumed dead. Miss Thorpe was last seen Monday evening when her roommate said she left the apartment to attend a lecture at the university. Miss Lou was reported missing Tuesday by her roommate and lifelong friend, Julie Chang. Yeah. Miss Chang said her missing roommate was last seen in the university library Monday evening. Miss Chang told police her roommate never before spent the night away. Police said both missing co-eds had a habit of hitchhiking around the Oceanside College community. Since January 1st, seven persons have been murdered in Santa Cruz County. One of the victims was Cynthia Shaw, 19, a co-ed from nearby Cabrillo College, whose dismembered body was found washed up on a beach over a period of several days. Another Cabrillo College co-ed, Mary Gilfoyle, see this one isn't <clears throat> one of Kemper's victims, disappeared on October, in October while hitchhiking from the college to Santa Cruz. A private investigator hired by her family presumes she is dead. No trace has been found of her. In addition, the skull of a long-missing Fresno State College co-ed was found by hunters last fall in the forest area north of Santa Cruz. And here we go. But at least they're starting to the newspapers starting to put the puzzle together. Yeah, but the difference is true crime recliners. I think you might actually be one just hiding on YouTube. Uh, investiga investigators have failed to turn up clues on the whereabouts of two college co-eds who disappeared while hitchhiking earlier this week. Alice Liu, uh, 21, and this is, now we're still on the 10th here, so eight murders including, so there, this article's pretty much the same here. Since January 1st, seven persons have been murdered in Santa Cruz. Yeah, you had a, well, he had 145 IQ. Not sure what level you put that at, but. And this is them. Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Liu right there. And here's a better picture of Allison. Or, I don't know if it's a better picture, but... Smiling there. Here's her, another picture of Rosalind. Looks almost identical, just straight on. Okay, so students were searching the woods and ravines of the sprawling University of California Santa, Santa Cruz campus today for any trace of two missing co-eds. The search got underway at, as the coroner was trying to determine the cause of death of Mary Guilfoyle, 24, a Cabrillo College co-ed, whose body was discovered Sunday in the mountains near Bonnie Dune. She was identified yesterday from dental charts. Uh, she was shot to death. And so that's not one of, you know, it's not really a camp. Well, he killed other people, but it's, um, it fits this other killer. So here it is. There's a guy named Herbert M uh, Mullen, 25, an unemployed engineering aide. And I think he's another serial killer. Hold on a second. Herbert Mullen.
Yeah, so there he is. See, this is this is what's so crazy about this. This guy here, he killed all of these people. But look at the dates. 72, 72. It was right during Kemper's time in the exact same area. He killed Lawrence White, Mary Guilfoyle, the one that we just talked about, Henry Tamai, Jim, you know. I mean, hell, maybe this this is one that we could <laughs> look at at some point. Um, heck, I have a, a half-brother named David Hughes. Hey, thanks, classical guitarist. David Allen Olicker, Robert Michael Spector. Look at all these people. But isn't that incredible that, that this right here is the in the exact place at the exact same time that Ed Kemper is doing his thing. I mean, it's just, you definitely wouldn't want to live in that area during that time. It's crazy. Yeah, so they're talking about him right here. Police said they found a 22 caliber rifle in his car. A witness said she saw a car like Mullen stop near Perez's home. A, mon a man got out and fired a single shot at Perez. Investigators said a rifle of the same caliber and model as the one found in Mullen's car was used in the murders of five persons here last month. Yeah, and so over here it says, you know, there, students hunt missing co-eds. The head of Mary Ann Pesky 19, a Fresno State University student, was found last August on Loma Prieta Mountain. Anita Luchessa, 18, a friend of Miss Pesky, disappeared at the same time. Oh my God, uh, Chloe's just doing laps. She's going like 100 miles an hour. <laughs> What's going on? Wow, she's just unbelievable. So at the time they were sort of linking, is it possible that Alice, Lou, and Roslyn Thorpe were killed by this Herbert Mullen guy, you know? Okay, now there's another update here. Three bodies found, two headless. This is on, this is just two days after that last article. The bodies of three women, two of them decapitated, were found yesterday in the East Bay opening up new avenues of investigation. None could be identified immediately. There was speculation that the two headless uh, corpses might be those of two University California Santa Cruz students missing since February 5th, but these were so badly decomposed that some doubt was shed on that possibility. However, the decapitation seemed to fit a pattern in the Santa Cruz mysteries. The head of Marianne Pesky 19, a Fresno State University student, was found last August on Loma Prieta Mountain. Um, Anita Luchessa, 18, a friend of Miss Pesky, disappeared at the same time. Another of the victims, Cynthia Ann Shaw, 19, a USC Santa Cruz co-ed. Now they're putting the pieces together here. From San Rafael was identified from parts of her body that floated ashore near Santa Cruz. The body of one of the four known victims, Mary Guilfoyle, 24, of Corbeil College student, was intact. See, that's where it's different. That's why he wasn't, that wasn't from the same killer, right? Uh, autopsies were scheduled today in an effort to determine the cause of death and the identities of the East Bay bodies. Authorities were particularly anxious to determine whether two of them might be the remains of Alice Liu, and Rosalind Thorpe, 24. The headless remains were found off Eden Canyon Road. So let's do this one. Eden Canyon Road. Where is that? Oops, didn't spell it right. Hmm. Eden Canyon Road. 
Castro Valley, is it? There it is. And that's 580. So it says, the headless remains were found off Eden County Road, 1.7 miles from Interstate 580. So we, we can actually do this. So here we go. We'll take the measuring tool and go boom, boom. Put it on. Miles. Go around. Okay, that's a we're only a quarter mile in at this point. That's point six. I need to go one point seven. Three seven point four five point five three, and it's probably like right, almost right there. Right there is the distance. And this is where the headless remains were found. I don't know who they are yet, but. Hey, thanks, Emily Flotilla, Nicole Wilson, and Apocalypse Fra. Yeah, he's, he's an absolute nightmare, this guy. <laughs> I mean, he's not. Uh, so let's see if there's a street view right there. Ah, no, nope. darn it. You think somebody would have driven on there? I mean, Google Earth people drive down in the middle of nowhere, but not this time. Okay. Autopsies were scheduled uh, today in an effort to determine the cause of death and the identities of the East Bay bodies. Oh, and, and let's see, where they write? Nicole Wilson had a, a wave, Emily Fotilla mini wave, Nicole Wilson with a bigger wave, and then Apocalypse from. Let's see. The body was one of four known victims. Uh, let's see. Another of the victims was Cynthia Ann Shaw. So that's, we've already got that part. We're over here. Let's see. The headless remains were found off Eden Canyon Road, 1.7 miles from Interstate Route 580. One was closed. The other, uh, I can't really, I, I think I cropped it too low. Investigators were able to take fingerprints from the Caucasian woman's body, but the other was in such advanced stage of decomposition that this could not be done. The third body, which was intact, was badly decomposed was found off Morgan Territory Road, nine miles southwest of Clayton. So I don't think that one's related. This body was nude and virtually a skeleton, officials said. It was not possible to estimate the age of the woman and fingerprints were not, could not be taken. All right, then we got five days more into the future here. And two headless bodies are identified. So here we go. Two headless bodies found 60 miles from here were identified today as missing Santa Cruz area co-eds intensifying an investigation which might link the gruesome murders of at least four young women with the slangs of 10 persons for which a young drug user is being held. Nope, they got that wrong. Hey, thank you for becoming a Megazoid. That's a equivalent to five regular... <laughs> people. 
Anyways, thank you very much. No, what, what does no Anthony Wrench mean? Uh, let's see. Uh, the Alameda County Coroner's Office said the bodies found in Hilly County east of here were those of Rosalind, Rosalind Thorpe, 23, and Alice Lou. So those, that's who those were. Alice Lou and Rosalind Thorpe were those two bodies that were found. Uh, both girls disappeared February 5th while hitchhiking between Santa Cruz and the nearby University of California campus. On February 18th, the decomposed body of Mary Guilfoyle, 24, another co-ed was found. See, and that's the, that one they believe is Herbert M. Mullen, another serial killer, uh, in the exact same area. Last month, the dismembered parts of a young woman's body were washed up nearby beaches and identified as Cynthia Shaw. That's one of Kemper's. In May 1972, Mary Ann Pesky, 19, and Anita Luchessa also... 19 disappeared and were believed to have been in the Santa Cruz area. Miss Pesky's head was found in the mountains. So, and so they're, they really, they're kind of trying to put them all on Mullins at this point. Like right over here, Mullen was accused of killing Kathy Prentice Francis, 29, and her sons, David Hughes, 9, and Damon Francis, 4, who were found dead January 24th. He was also charged in the murder of James Guianera, 24, his wife, Joan, blah, 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 blah. I mean, he just goes on and on. That guy killed a lot of people. So that was an incorrect um, association. On March 6th, one more skull jawbone of two slain coeds found in sea cliffs. I mean, look at this sick shit going on. You know, so a skull and jawbone found in rocks above the Pacific Ocean were identified Monday as belonging to two University of California Santa Cruz co-eds whose headless bodies were found on February 15th, some 30 miles away from the east side of San Francisco Bay. Dismembered bodies of five girls have been found in the mountainous areas south of San Francisco since last summer. I mean, was there some kind of weird drug going around? I mean, because Bundy was right around this time, too. You know? I mean, it's amazing. This, It seems like from, like, 70 to 77, there's just these tons and tons of absolutely monstrous serial killers out there. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe LSD or something. I mean, it's just kind of odd, you know? Although, you know, Kemper doesn't seem like somebody that was ever doing LSD. I don't know what uh, what Bundy was doing, but Kemper, is, I think, is just a legit psycho, right? Like, the one <laughs> born that way. I, I, would, I would think Bundy did some stuff. Yeah. PCP, angel dust. have been found in the mountain areas. Dennis John Beckstead of San Mateo made a comparison of the latest find. He said the teeth, many of which contain silver fillings, compared with dental charts of Rosalind Thorpe, 25, of Carmel, California, and Alice Lou, 21, of Torrance, California, and matched up 100%. The girls were last seen hitchhiking on the campus February 5th, their decapitated bodies were found 10 days later near Eden Canyon Road in Alameda County. Miss Lou's hands also had been cut off, police said. The skull, jawbone, pieces of facial bone, and a mass of dark hair caught in a, a strand of barbed wire were discovered Sunday by Robert Stark, 15, and Lon Carter, 16, both of my... Uh, Montana, uh, was it Montana, California? As they hiked above the coast highway, Lieutenant Ray Souza of Alameda County Sheriff's Office disclosed Beckstead's findings. He said the skull apparently belonged to Miss Thorpe, 
and the jawbone was mislose. A small hole in the skull was being examined to determine whether it was a gunshot, he said. The neatly done dismemberment of the bodies appeared similar to the carving of Cynthia Shaw, 19, a Cabrillo College co-ed from San Rafael who disappeared January 8th. Pieces of her body started washing up two days later along a 20-mile stretch of beach. The body of Mary Guilfoyle, 24, was found intact. Yes, yeah, so that's not related. The head of Mary Ann Pesky, 19, a Fresno State University student, was found without a body last August in the same mountains. Her friend Anita Lucessa, 18, disappeared at the same time and has not been found. Herbert Mullen, 25, a one-time... Yeah, so they're trying to keep talking about him all the time. Okay, so then... Kemper is arrested. Okay, so I'm trying to do this in a specific order here. And basically he was arrested because... He, he called the police. So sheriff deputies found the bodies of two women in an apartment earlier yesterday after a telephone call from a man in Colorado who said he killed them. The suspect, identified as Edmund Kemper, 24, was arrested at a telephone booth in Pueblo, Colorado while talking to Santa Cruz police about the killings. It's almost like he made, did this full circle deal. It's pretty weird. The slain victims were nude and one body had been decapitated. The slayings in nearby Aptos were the 17th and 18th this year in Santa Cruz area, which is crazy because that, those are Kemper and that, that Mullen guy together combined. Now, Santa Cruz County Sheriff Doug James said city police traced the call while Kemper was on the phone and notified authorities in Pueblo. Kemper was arrested by three officers who reported two rifles a shotgun, a pistol, and several rounds of ammunition were seized during the arrest of Kemper. James said deputies were sent to the two-story duplex at about 5.30 a.m. after police received the phone call. He said the bodies were found in a closet in the first floor unit. Both were nude, he said, and the head of one had been severed. Okay, so let me, I'm going to right then switch over to that case all right so here we go and I think I have this location let me see it maybe not I uh, will just get to it when we get to it the unclosed bodies of, Ap of an Aptos woman and her woman friend were found stuffed in closets at the woman's home early today. Authorities in Pueblo, Colorado have arrested the slain woman's son, Edmund Emil Kemper, 24, in connection with the deaths. So at this point, they don't have any idea that he's associated with the, the other ones. He was, ar he was arrested while making a telephone call to Santa Cruz police to confess to the double slaying. While on the line with Santa Cruz police, Colorado authorities were notified and were able to arrest him before he hung up the, hung up the Associated Press reported. The Sheriff's Department at press time wasn't able to positively identify the victims, although Sheriff Doug James reported that one of the victims was Kemper's mother. One source identified the suspect's mother as Clarnell Strandberg, 52, and I think I do have this one, 609, there it is right there. So this is up in, uh, this is, wait, so this is Kemper lives here. So this is Kemper's home. Although, does it say that? I think that's her home, but I thought he may, maybe he lived there too, because hmm. at one time it mentions his name and that address, but I guess we'll see. One source identified the suspect's mother as Clarnell Strandberg, 50, uh, 609A Ord Street, Aptos. Now let me do that again. Yeah, Aptos. 
to Aptos, Colorado? Let me do this again. Hold on a second. 609. Let's Word Street. No, this is Aptos, California, right? Yeah. There we go. And see, there's two apartments. He lived in A. But A could either be, there's two of them. It's either this one or that one. I don't know which one it was. But apparently, uh, in this article, it's saying that his mother lived here. But another article, that's where Kemper lives. So I guess we'll have to check that out. The other victim was not has not been identified, but authorities, and that doesn't look the same. And I thought this was in Colorado. Oh, no, he called in to say that they were killed. Let's see. <laughs> Authorities wheel the second of two slain women from Aptos Duplex, where their bodies were found by sheriff deputies. The women were found stuffed into closets in the downstairs apartment. Kemper 24 is the suspect slain who was arrested in Pueblo, Colorado. Okay, so I think he went to Colorado to call in about that. Not that they were killed in Colorado. Uh, the sheriff's department at press time wasn't able to positively uh, identify the victim, positively identify the victims, although Sheriff Doug James reported that one of the victims was Kemper's mother. One source identified the suspect's mother as Clarnell Strandberg, 52, of 609A Ord Street. The other victim has not been identified, but authorities are checking to see if she is Sally Hallett, 59, who is a co worker of a USC, UCSC with Miss Strandberg. A missing persons report was filed with Santa Cruz police last weekend by Miss Hallett's son, who arrived at the mother's house Saturday following a tip. Christopher Hallett told police he came to the house to pick up his mother's car, which he was going to use to drive to Berkeley to uh, fetch his daughter and bring her back to Santa Cruz. Hallett told police he arrived home Saturday afternoon and his mother was gone. He found no note. The back door was unlocked and the car was gone. Hallett then called Mrs. Sandberg, who said his mother's best friend, she too was missing. Following Kemper's telephone call, the Santa Cruz police authorities rushed to Ord Street Duplex where they found the bodies about 5.30 a.m. So it looks like that's gone, that building. That doesn't look anything like that now. Although, you know, that looks almost uh, absolutely the same. Let me go over here. I just happened to look down the street there and let me just... Man, that's weird. No, God, it looks so similar. But I bet it looked like that back then. Very close to that look. I mean, if you look at that with the stairs going up and everything. So probably at one point, you know, let me see what that other building is right behind there. Let me just see. It's possible. I see that taller building right behind it. Oh, man, is that it right there? That's it. Man, I got the wrong address on there. I guess it's the same property. Hold on. That's it right there. Boom. 100%. Hey, you guys want to see it? We can do our little boom. <laughs> All right, watch this. See that window? Rectangle. Then this one goes up like that. Then this window. Then the stairs. So we'll just move it over. See that? That little rectangle thing. Stairs going up. That one. Now this thing's not, that lattice isn't there, but that doesn't mean shit. So that's it right there. That's where the women were murdered. Okay. I'm glad I looked around the corner there. That's strange though. It actually knew what A and B were. If you typed them in, it would switch it. So. 
At a press conference late this morning, James told newsmen he refused to speculate on Kemper may have been involved with other slangs. See? He admitted the suspect had been doing a lot of talking. Well, the thing is, when he when he called, and then they get there, they see a beheaded person, and now he's from, you know, Santa Clara, so then you start going, well, shit, did he do these other ones? So it says up here, still unsolved locally are the slayings of at least five co-eds, Rosalind Thorpe, Alice Liu, and so forth. They keep throwing Guilfoyle in there, but um, not related. I wonder if that person's related to Kimberly Guilfoyle. That's such an unusual name, you know? I think I just need a new chair. <laughs> Listen to this thing. It's just so loud. I've tried the damn WD-40, but it doesn't do anything. And the chair's getting old. I need a new one. Oh yeah, and here's another, here's a better picture of it too. So this one will even be more verifiable here. Look at that. Yep. Got a different uh, wood on the stair, but the door is there. Everything. Yeah, boom. Okay, so then I'm going to go back to the arrest part, there's a couple more there, <clears throat> and then I'm going to go through the wiki of each victim, you know, as people learn what actually happened. It doesn't say that in the papers, it was at trial. Uh, sheriff deputies found the bodies of two women in the apartment early yesterday. The suspect, identified as Edmund Kemper, 24, was arrested at a telephone booth. The slangs in nearby Aptos were the 17th and 18th this year. Santa Cruz County Sheriff Doug James said city police traced the call while Kemper was on the phone. Kemper was arrested by three officers who reported two rifles, a shotgun, a pistol, and several rounds of ammunition were found. Yeah, so that was 25th, 27th, and then we're going to get one where his picture's in the paper on the 27th. Right here. There he is. The Barbarian. Six foot nine, 280 pounds. Edmund Kemper, the Barbarian. Let's see. Sheriff deputies Thursday dug up what appeared to be a human skull from the backyard of the apartment building where confessed killer Edmund E. Kemper III lived. He must have lived with his mom then. Right then. The small dirt plot on the center of a concrete patio. God, is that still there? Hold on. Because I was looking through. I couldn't find it yesterday. I wonder if it's just right there. I mean. Center of a concrete patio. So it's the backyard. Though. The small dirt plot in the center of a concrete patio. Now, I thought he had like roommates or something. I'll have to figure that out. But The small dirt plot in the center of a concrete patio was pinpointed by the hefty 24-year-old camper who told officers he buried some of the nine persons he admitted slaying in this in this uh, mountainous coastal resort area, Santa Cruz County Sheriff deputies began digging in the yard early Thursday after District Attorney Peter Chang returned from Pueblo, Colorado, where Kemper was arrested while confessing in a telephone call. Officers said that discovery of what appeared to be human skull was the first indication of truth in Kemper's story of burying some bodies. Other locations were where dismembered parts of bodies may be buried were being checked. 
The Pueblo police officers who arrested the hefty California uh, Californian who admitted killing his mother, one of her friends and six co-eds, said he couldn't believe Edmund Kemper's size. I came up in a cruiser and he looked like three people sitting in that phone booth, said a patrolman, David M. Martinez. Martinez arrested Kemper 24 of Aptos Tuesday after the man called Santa Cruz authorities and said he wanted to surrender. When they said on the police radio that he was six foot nine and 280 pounds, I couldn't imagine anyone that big, he said. Originally, police asked for a two-man car to go to the phone booth, but Martinez was instead went instead because he was just a few blocks away. He was warned that the suspect was armed and dangerous. I moved into the area and spotted him in the phone booth with his back to me, Martinez said. Then I put on my red lights, pulled my revolver, and eased from the cruiser. I wasn't taking any chances. Martinez, 30, father of three children, tapped on the glass of the phone booth when he approached Kemper. First, I came up. He hadn't noticed me yet and checked his hands to see if he was armed. He was still talking to Santa Cruz when I came up. When I told him to move outside, he asked, What do I do with the phone? I told him, Just drop it. Kemper walked outside with his hands up and then leaned against the phone booth while Martinez searched him. It took about four minutes for the backup car to arrive, but to me it seemed like four hours. Martinez said there was enough ammunition in Kemper's nearby car to hold off an army for about a week. <laughs> it's not likely that I'll ever make it as big of an arrest again, he said. Kemper agreed to return to Santa Cruz to face murder charges. He signed extradition papers after turning down the offer of a court-appointed attorney. I don't think it's necessary, Your Honor, Kemper told the judge. So there he is right there. Okay, so what order do I want to go in? Yeah, so I'm going to go read the wiki. I already did the grandparents wiki, so let's do the... So Marianne Pesky and Anita Luchessa. Huh? Who are you guys talking to? Are there, there's like arguing going on in here? Alright, actually, on May 7th, 1972, Kemper was driving in Berkeley, California when he picked up two 18-year-old hitchhiking students from Fresno State University, Mary Ann Pesky and Anita Mary Luchessa, with uh, the pretense of taking them to Stanford University. After driving for an hour, he managed to reach a secluded wooded area near Alameda, uh, Alameda, California, with which uh, he was familiar from his work at the highway department. Without alerting, alerting his passengers that he had changed directions from where they wanted to go, it was there that he handcuffed Pesky and locked Luchessa in the trunk, then stabbed and strangled Pesky to death subsequently killing Luchessa in a similar manner. Kemper later confessed that while handcuffing Pesky, he brushed the back of his hand against one of her breasts and, and it embarrassed him, adding that he said, whoops, I'm sorry, or something like that, after grazing her breast despite murdering her minutes later. Kemper put both of the women's bodies in the trunk of his Ford Galaxy and returned to his apartment. He was stopped on the way by police officers for having a broken taillight. Can you believe that? But the officer did not detect the corpse, the corpses in the car. Kemper's roommate was not home, so he took the bodies in his apartment where he photographed and had sexual intercourse with the naked corpses before dismembering them. He then put 
body parts into plastic bags, which he later abandoned near Loma Pieta Mountain. Before disposing of Pesky and Lucesa's severed head in a ravine, Kemper engaged in what's called um, iru, irumatio with both of them. And that's um, having sex with a severed head, you know, like a head, just a head. In August of that year, Pesky's skull was found on Loma Pieta Mountain. An extensive search failed to turn up the rest of Pesky's remains or a trace of Lucessa. You see what an absolute barbarian this guy is? I mean, he's just, uh, wow. Okay, and then Iko Ku Wiki on her. Um, on the evening of September 14th, 1972, Kemper picked up 15-year-old dance student named Iko Ku, who had decided to hitchhike to a dance class. This is the one that was in the paper, the dancer after missing her bus. So she missed her bus and she decided to hitchhike. He again drove to a remote area where he pulled a gun on Ku before accidentally locking himself out of the car. However, Ku let him back inside despite the fact that the gun was still in the car. I mean, she was just so scared. She's probably like, if I let him in, maybe he'll let me, you know, God, it's just sucks. Uh, Back inside the car, he proceeded to choke her unconscious, rape her, and kill her. Kemper, Kemper subsequently packed Ku's body into the trunk of his car and went to a nearby bar to have a few drinks. Then returned to his apartment. He later confessed that after exiting the bar, he opened the trunk of his car, admiring his catch like a fisherman. Back at his apartment, he had sexual intercourse with the corpse, then dismembered and disposed of the remains in a similar manner as his previous two victims. Ku's mother called the police to report the disappearance of her daughter, but hundreds of flyers asking for information, but she did not receive any responses regarding her daughter's location or status. And then Cindy Shaw, the, the uh, one that had the younger picture used. On January 7, 1973, Kemper had moved back in with his mother. Okay, so that's the mother's house. Was driving around the Cabrito College campus when he picked up 18-year-old student Cynthia Ann Cindy Shaw. He drove to a wooded area and fatally shot her with a 22 caliber pistol. He then placed her body in the trunk of his car and drove to his mother's house where he kept her body hidden in a closet in his room overnight. When his mother left for work the next morning, he had sexual intercourse with and removed the bullet from Shal's corpse, then dismembered and decapitated her in his mother's bathtub. Kemper kept Shal's severed head for several days regularly engaging in that same uh, iromatio with it, then buried it in his mother's garden facing upward towards the, her bedroom. After his arrest, he stated that he did this because his mother always wanted people to look up to her. <laughs> ah, jeez, what a man. He discarded the rest of Shaw's remains by throwing them off a cliff. Over the course of the following weeks, all except her head and right hand were discovered and pieced together like a macabre jigsaw puzzle. The pathologist determined that Shaw had been cut into pieces with a power saw. And just... Okay, I gotta open that up for that one. I forgot to get that one. So I'm just doing it in this order because the other ones, none of that was listed in the paper and I didn't want to give away that part yet until the arrest. All 
Okay, so let me just read the Allison, Roslyn Thorpe and Allison Lou part right here. On February 5th, 1973, after a heated argument with his mother, Kemper left his house in search of possible victims. With heightened suspicion of a serial killer preying on hitchhikers in Santa Cruz area, students were advised, so, I mean, that was a big campaign to keep people from not hitchhiking. Students were advised to accept rides only from cars with university stickers on them. Kemper had been able to obtain such a sticker, and his mother worked at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He encountered 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Allison Lou on the UCSC campus. According to Kemper, Thorpe entered his car first, reassuring Lou to also enter. He first fatally shot Thorpe and then Lou with his 22 caliber pistol and wrapped their bodies in blankets. Kemper again brought his victims back to his mother's house. This time he beheaded them in his car and carried the headless corpses into his mother's house to have sexual intercourse with them. He then dismembered the bodies, removed the bullets to prevent identification, and discarded their remains the next morning. Some remains were found at Eden Canyon a week later, and more were found near Highway 1 in March. When questioned in an interview as to why he dismembered his victims, he explained, the head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy. You know, the head is where everything is uh, at, and uh, the brain, eyes, mouth, that's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. Well, that's not quite true. There's a lot left in the girl's body without a head. <laughs> this guy, you got to admit, man, it's just... All right, so then when he killed his mother, so here we go. On April 20th, 1973, after coming home from a party, 52-year-old Clonell Elizabeth Strandberg awakened her son with her arrival. While sitting in her bed reading a book, she noticed Kemper enter her room and said to him, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Kemper replied, no. Good night. He then waited for her to fall asleep. Then he snuck back into her room to bludgeon her with a claw hammer and slit her throat with a, a pen knife. He then decapitated her and engaged in irumatia ir with her, his mother's head. Can you believe that? Then used it as a dartboard. I mean, so then he put her head up on the wall and started throwing darts at it. Kemper stated that he put her head on a, sh okay, a shelf instead and screamed at it for an hour, threw darts at it, and ultimately smashed her face in. He also cut out her tongue and larynx and put it in the garbage disposal. However, the garbage disposal could not break down the tough vocal cords and ejected the tissue back into the sink. That seemed appropriate, Kemper later said. As much as she'd bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. Kemper then hid his mother's corpse in a closet and went to drink at a nearby bar. Upon his return, he invited his mother's best friend, 59 year old Sarah Taylor. Uh, let's see. Upon his return, he invited his mother's best friend, 59 year old Sarah Taylor Hallett, over to the house to have dinner and watch a movie wait so he did this wow when Helen arrived Kemper strangled her to death to create a cover story that his mother and Hallett had gone away together on vacation he subsequently put Hallett's corpse in a closet obscured any outward signs of disturbance and left a note to police it read Approximately 5.15 a.m. Saturday. No need for her to suffer anymore at the hands of this 
horrible, murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted. Not sloppy and incomplete gents. Just a lack of time. I got things to do. Afterward, Kemper fled the scene. He drove nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado, taking caffeine pills to stay awake for the over 1,000-mile journey. He had three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition in his car, and he believed he was the target of an active manhunt. After not hearing any news on the radio about the murder of his mother, Ann Hallett, when he arrived in Pueblo, he found a phone booth and called the police. He confessed to the murder of his mother and Hallett, but the police did not take his call seriously and told him to call back at a later time. Several hours later, Kemper called again, asking to speak to an officer personally uh, that, he pop- that he knew personally. He confessed to that officer of the killing of his mother and Hallett, then waited for the police to arrive and take him into custody where he also confessed to the murders of six students. Well, why did he go all the way to Colorado if he meant to turn himself in? When asked in a later interview why he turned himself in, Kemper said the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real emotional purpose. It was just pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer toward the end there. I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing and at that point of near exhaustion, near collapse I just said to hell with it and called it all off. (laughs) Man. I mean, how's that for a barbarian, right? And then I do have this other part that I was going to read. It was the uh, Why doesn't it show there? Oh yeah, and then he he confessed to police, but then he decided that he would go to trial instead. So then they had to, you know, do the insanity plea. Now let me let me check this out. Hold on. So the backyard. What's what's a backyard in this? Oh, where? Look at that. That's that. Let me check this out. Hold on a second. I might have I might have the picture for this one. Yeah, man, I think this might be the exact spot right here. I have a feeling that's right back there. That's where they're looking. Let me let me just can I go I can't go any further can I get up here though and Oh man can't do it man just if I could be right there I could see it but I think that's the spot right there on the on the cement patio just like they said I mean, actually, it could just be right over here, like right right in this area. And then is there a home? Let me see if there's a home over there with the roof. There we go. Hold on. Uh, no, that's sorry. I can't do that. Yeah, that roof over here doesn't match that one, but maybe there's one over here. Yeah, that could be the, what we're seeing over there. Yeah, I don't think so, though. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think it might be back there. Yeah, so what we'll do here in a minute, let, let me read this trial. Well, here's what I'll do. I, uh, I'm going to go take my, my nightly, uh, i got to do my vacation now. It's two hours in. <laughs> yeah. And, man, I keep shifting around on that thing. 
And then we'll do the trial portion and then we'll watch some of his videos, his interrogation stuff, okay? How do you, what do you think of that? Oh, thanks, Grace. Hey, do you, I mean, do you guys like that presentation like that? Because it really makes it feel like you're, wow, you know, you're, you're kind of at the crime scenes, the different places, you know, you can get a feel for it. I know that most of you like it, uh, <laughs> but some people may, might not. It's too slow or something. Oh, there it is. Oh, look at that. I didn't even know I had that one up there. But... Beholder. <laughs> look at that face, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, time to get a new chair. Thank you, Perry Ma. Please put this money toward a new chair for yourself. You do so much for everyone else. I think I'll do that. Thanks, Nicole Wilson. Kathy Frydenmaker. Gatorade on the ice. I'm going to try to do this thing like I did that other. Beach. There we go. Now we can have. There we go. <laughs> hey, look at that. Hey. Kathy Frydenmaker. Gatorade on ice. Apocalypse Fra. Chair fund. Yeah. Welcome, Dark Side. Alright, I'm gonna go get a I'm gonna go get a water. I'll be right back. Thank you, Lori Fisher and Emily Flotilla. Sunscreen? Yeah. Mankini, man. <laughs> I don't think I look too good in a mankini at this point. I'm starting to try to get back in there. Sunscreen. My foot's better now. Everything's better so I can exercise more. Okay. Thankfully. Thank you, living it. As in, living the dream. That's a lot of, uh, that's a heck of a lot of umbrellas in there. Nope, no mankini, no mankini. Where 
use that. Yeah. So he killed his first, you know, his grandparents because he just wanted to see what it felt like. So there was no anger there. I think he uses that as an excuse. You know? There's no way in hell he was... These, these girls were... Uh, like, he just killed them because he wanted to. You can see it in the various... Uh, you know, I think later on when he realized, learned the psycho babble, babble that he came up with something else. But. Oh yeah, this is one I wanted to show you. I'll show you guys in a minute. It's from 1976. And it just shows you that the truth back then, before he came up with the more recent, oh, it was my mom, you know. You like this shirt? Awesome. Yeah, he didn't get the death penalty. Not sure why. No, he he cut a deal. He well, no, he no, he didn't cut a deal. He, he went to trial, but he had confessed prior. But yeah, I don't know why he didn't get the death penalty. That is kind of weird. Maybe they just wanted to study the guy. He was on the stand, too. He testified. It'd be great to watch that. Well, I'll just make a short vacation so I can get back to this. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for the vacation support there. Get me, uh, what does that say, candlely? Yeah, get me set up with a new chair, you know. <laughs> Thanks, candlely. Ding, 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 ding. I don't know if they got rid of the death penalty in 74. I mean, that'd be kind of early. They still have the death penalty in California. They just never use it. Oh, yeah, back then. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. But. All right. There we go. This is the. I'm just going to do the wiki trial. Because there's a whole bunch of articles, but I don't. I think this just summarizes it pretty good. A member had had her water break. Oh, really? Oh, cool. I didn't know that. I was like, what does that even mean? It was so random. Um, freak. Call the baby freak. You know, uh, freak should be the middle name of any baby that is born under this uh, channel, right? Like, Gray Freak Hughes, you know. Oh, wait, hey, hey, Super Sleuth, it's Lance, okay? Don't forget the Lance part. All right, here we go. Uh, Kemper was indicted on eight counts of first-degree murder on May 7th, 1973, he was assigned to Chief Public Defender of Santa Cruz County Attorney Jim Jackson. Due to Kemper's explicit and detailed confession, his counsel's only option was to plead not guilty by reason of insanity to the charges. Uh, Kemper twice tried to commit suicide in custody. His trial went ahead. It probably just hurt too much, though, right? Three court-appointed psychiatrists found Kemper to be legally sane. One of the psychiatrists, Dr. Jewel Fort, investigated his juvenile records and his diagnosis that he was once, a, a, was once psychotic. Fort also interviewed Kemper, including under truth serum, and relayed to the court that Kemper had engaged in cannibalism. 
allegedly that he sliced flesh from the legs of his victims, then cooked and consumed these strips of flesh in a casserole. Nevertheless, Fort determined that Kemper was fully cognizant in each case and stated that Kemper enjoyed the prospect of infamy associated with being labeled a murderer. Kemper later recanted the confession of cannibalism. Right, yeah, you wouldn't want that in there. I actually think that's probably true. California used the, you know, some kind of a legal standard which held that for a defendant to establish a defense on the ground of insanity, it must be clearly proved that at the time of committing of the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of mind and not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing or if he did, did know it, that he did not know he was doing what was wrong. Yeah, knowing right from wrong. Kemper appeared to have known that the nature of his acts was wrong and he had shown signs of malice aforethought. On November 1st, Kemper took the stand. He testified that he... Now listen to this. Here's the real reason he killed people. Kemper took the stand. He testified that he killed the victims because he wanted them for myself, like possessions, and attempted to convince the jury that he was insane. Now, maybe, you know, he made that up because the... I just think he is... I mean, why did he kill his grandmother? Because he wanted to see what it felt like. That's what sociopathic, you know, psych... <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. To He must be a narcissist, everybody. He must be a narcissist. Yeah, so he took the stand. He testified that he killed the victims because he wanted them for myself, like possessions, and attempted to convince the jury that he was insane based on the reasoning that his actions could have been committed only by someone with an aberrant mind. He said that two beings inhabited his body and that when the killer personally took over, it was kind of like blacking out. You know, and it's weird too because in one of these interviews, for a minute, he seems like he's trying to pretend that he's having a conversation with somebody else. On November 8, 1973, the six-man, six-woman jury deliberated for five hours before declaring Kemper sane and guilty on all counts. He asked for the death penalty, requesting death by torture. However, with a more okay, there it is, a moratorium placed on capital punishment by the Supreme Court of California, he instead received seven years to life for each count. Seven years, Jesus with these terms to be served concurrently and was sentenced to California Medical Facility. Yeah. All right, so you got that. And then look at this one in 1976. In prison mass murder, Edmund Kemper wants a surgeon to eliminate part of his brain, which he feels drove him to kill 10 persons. Okay, you see that though? That doesn't say he's mad at his mom. Um, I had led a very violent life and wished to stop the violence while I can. Kemper wrote in a court petition, I have been through between 1964 and 1970 every accepted form of therapy with the result of eight more deaths at my hand. Housed in California, see, that's what I'm saying. You can't fix these people. Housed in California Medical Facility, Kemper 27 was convicted in Santa Cruz in 1973 of the grisly murders of 10 persons. He voluntarily surrendered to police and confessed to eight of the killings. Well, he only, you know, because he only killed, well, we don't know. Is there other victims that, uh, hmm, maybe there's more that we don't know about. While in his teens, he was sent to... He did kill 10 people, but two were his grandparents. But maybe they're talking about there's two more that they think, maybe. While in his teens, he was sent to a state mental hospital for the slaying 
of two of his grandparents, six years later, 1970, he was pronounced rehabilitated and was released. Solana County Superior Court Judge Thomas Healy denied Kemper's request last month for psychosurgery, but he left room for more proceedings if Kemper can prove he has a right to, medi- to this medical technique. As a matter of policy, the Department of Corrections opposes psychosurgery. There is just no way psychosurgery can be realistically evaluated at this time, said Dr. Eugene Prout, the chief physician at the prison. Much more study is needed, and I agree with those who say that the prison system is in no place to be, there's no place to study it. In his ruling, the judge said it does not appear that the legislature thus far has provided for the initiation of such proceedings by an individual prisoner. Yeah, you wanted to... I was thinking it was going to say lobotomy, but that's not what he called it. He wanted to take out a part of his... different part of his brain. Had a different name. Yeah. No, there, there's just, there's tons of stuff out there on it. Tons and tons of stuff. That here he is. I just thought I'd play these shorter ones. This one's just really long. They're in the description if you want to check them out. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. Yeah, that was uh, I think Lou. The, the Chinese, the girl from, that was Chinese. More than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. Just a second. This is what was described as a suicide brigade. 5,000 men trained in, just, in all these devastation ways, right? He goes off to war, and he does some horrible things. I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, How many? She didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. Good people see. A nice guy. Did you like Kemper? I like Kemper. You were able to appear... Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is... Ordinary person, non-threatening. He seems like the most normal... I mean, you know, it's hard to say it, but like... When you listen to him, he just sounds like a smart person that's talking. You would never picture that he was doing what he was doing. To I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. Very similar to uh, Dahmer, actually. I locked myself out. This guy. Very she similar. the door for me. I think my Dahmer was a pretty smart guy, too. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got how commanding these rages got i was raging inside there was just incredible energies positive and negative uh depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other and outside i looked troubled at times other times i looked moody Uh, other times perfectly serene not very sane but again people weren't even aware of what was happening. In 1972 and 1973, a series of murders shocked Northern California. College girls began to disappear while hitchhiking. Two of the victims were picked up from the campus of the University of California at Santa Cruz. That's where Ed Kemper's mother was working as an administrative assistant. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there? Yes. 
I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and See, this is all a bullshit. very strong and Excuses. violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, mm -hmm. hungry. Yeah. No. You and killed because you wanted woman. to, remember? I hated you said her, it earlier. But I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important well, to he her. Doesn't, he's not, there's no women, it. Charles. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent. Okay, so there you go. It's not but about emotionally, your Emotionally, I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate. And ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women. And I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first, there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. This fantastic passion. Uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. Wait, what happened here? Are you, who are you talking to, ducking felonies? <laughs> you talking to him? I'm kind of confused at what you're... I don't know, you're talking to this guy, right? I don't know who Huey, you're not talking to me, right? I don't know what a Huey is, I guess. I thought maybe, I, don't, I didn't block And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So it finally came down to okay. the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. Well, your comic got removed. It was going to happen. Now. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. In that first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For, I had it under my leg, out of sight parallel to my to my leg in the seat it was something that had been thought out in fantasy acted out felt out hundreds of times before it ever happened Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park he took one of them into the woods leaving the second girl tied in the car I just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her and I was in shock because of that I couldn't believe that it was that way and I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car. 
but it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop. Wow, this is huge crazy. <laughs> knife. And uh, it wasn't that swell. I of a kept knife. on it just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run, and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes, and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, better their chances. I thought I was pretty slick and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't, because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared. I haven't heard that. And minded their own business and looked the other way. Some of the people who are committing murders, even as we speak, if they're doing it by themselves and they tell no one about it, they could go on undetected until they decided to stop. And the police wouldn't catch them unless we just happened to roll up on them while they were doing it. Even after police warnings against hitchhiking and an increased bus schedule on the campus, Kemper had no trouble picking up hitchhikers. Ironically, one warning advised riding only in cars with university stickers. Kemper's car had such a sticker. My mother worked at the campus and I had an A sticker on my car and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started oh, talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear. You know, but they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff telling me about it so how come they get in a car with somebody at that time she judged me not to be that guy yeah see, I okay. didn't look like him yeah see <laughs> it's getting easier to do I was getting better at it I was getting less detectable I started flaunting that invisibility severing yeah, a yeah. human head yeah. two of them at night in front of my mother's residence Oops. with her at home my neighbors at home upstairs there. Their picture window open. Well, it's the still playing, open. but I'm not sure what's going on right there. Okay. Yeah. He probably would have been a good, um, like, investigator, you know? Like, it's weird listening to him. He explains things well. He seems like he actually understands, like, what... It's just really strange, really bizarre. Uh, maybe I'll go back to that in a little bit. Let me move it over to this part here, though. So that's a different look there. Look at how different he looks here. How would you select your victims? I didn't select them. It was random. And it was uh, also the, the development of the passion. If I was drove, they died. Like the last two victims. Yes, I I've was seen so man hunter. I killed anybody. It has nothing to do with this. Mine hunter. But there were times I drove a woman and her son clear up into Oregon crossed over to the coast highway and drove back down. And like 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, fog, misty highway, and I'm driving along. There's not a car near me. I'm, it's totally alien county. This is way up around Eureka or something. And here's these two high, probably high school girls. They looked up at me 17 or 18 years old. They're hitching the first ride into town because they've snuck off the farm. They've gone the half a mile or so out to the road, and they're going to hit on into town, have a good time, and sneak back. It was obvious, because they were grabbing the first ride they could get. And here, I've been fighting my inner impulses to not go off on this woman and her 12-year-old son, who's hitchhiking clear back to Seattle, right? And I'm struggling with these feelings. I don't want to do it. Man, you ought to do it anyway. You're weak. You're a punk. Nah, I don't want to do it. All day long, I'm doing this. And by the time I'm coming back down that highway, I'm exhausted. I'm saying, oh, whoa, and I'm driving along just to get home. 
And here's a perfect situation. I cannot get busted. It exceeds the criterion of picking someone up and not getting caught. No one knows me in the county. No one's seen me going through it, right? It's a fog shroud at night. Nobody could even see me if their home was in view. And I don't know them. I picked them up. We drove into town about two miles, three miles. I dropped them off. I got some gas and kept right on going. I was not in a proper state of mind to do something like that. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. It was like it's handed to me on a platter. It scared the hell out of me. He was. <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> It scared the hell out of him that he couldn't kill a mother and child. Everything I needed. And to go back to your first... Uh... Again, so about the selection and the preparation. If I was selecting and preparing and everything was all set, that's it. I got him. But I didn't. They're not dead. I think his relative I has a chance. I an example of many times that kind of thing happened. All of a sudden, somebody shows up out of nowhere... I pick them up, take them where they're going, but I didn't do nothing to them because it was uh, the mindset was all wrong. The only time people got killed was when she and I was fighting like cats and dogs, and I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't invent it any other way. I look back on it, and I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying I'm looking back, I'll go back on it and saying, I think they were surrogates. I was killing her, not them. I was attacking her station. I was attacking her stance in that university setting. Also, I hated the university for what it was doing to Blame her. Blame it on mom. She worked her butt off. They took every bit of it. Oh, she yeah. The power. Okay, here's some more. You want some more authority? You want some more responsibility? Here. It was eating her up. She went into that job sober. She came out of the job damn near canned because she went to work drunk one day. She couldn't cope with it, and it was destroying her a little at a time. She needed help, but if you told her she needed a mental if I told her she needed a mental hospital, if my little sister told her she needed a mental hospital or a dry out program and peeled our skin for us, we did not mess with that woman. My sister, my little sister, was cheating on her husband when my mother was murdered. If she had known my little sister was doing that, she'd have, she probably would have been out of the family. That was totally outrageous to her Victorian mores as she grew up. These twisted Victorian bullshit uh, ideals that her mother laid on her as a kid twisted her life with and then she tried to run that shit on my dad you said you had a lot of sympathy and empathy towards Marianne Pesce when you talked to her but isn't that strange to say that after you had killed her in such a brutal fashion there was a draw there was a draw to the young lady it was haunting I'm not saying I had compassion toward her when I talked to her I tried to remember what we talked about and in fact, I think it, what I said about her was is that she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady. She's kind of stuck up, distant. I look back on it and I see a girl that was not beautiful. She was not plain. She was somewhere in between. And she was caught up in that beauty thing, like kids in the valley are, okay? Valley girls trying to make something of themselves and exploit little attributes they have and to downplay other ones. And she was playing a little bit distant with me. And her friend was very open and very, her roommate was very open and very a country girl talking and stuff. And it's sad because the Pesh was the, uh, Marianne was the uh, expert no, Pesh, hitchhiking. No, she had been half her life in Europe. She'd hitchhiked around Europe. Uh, she'd done it in the United States. She was good at it. She didn't want to get in the car. But she had talked her, she had two roommates, okay? And one went on the trip with her to Berkeley and to Stanford and back to Fresno State. Only one would go with her. And apparently, I'm thinking back, the other one was so close to going that later when she found out what happened to her two roommates, she dropped out of college. She came to testify at my trial. And she was devastated by the whole thing. So I'm thinking she almost went. And she realized she might have died too. Who knows? But yeah. uh, I don't even know that I'd have picked them up if there's three of them. I don't know. I don't know if they'd have been where they were. See, all the circumstances could have changed. But I, I'm thinking that it, uh, because it had such a violent effect on her college education, she was that close to going. The other girl, Anita Luchessa, wasn't a hitchhiker. She had been raised by her family. You don't do things like that. That's totally out of line. And her friend talked her into it. And once she got into it and she saw how much fun it was and they meet the different people and they talk with people, that by the time they're leaving Berkeley, right, it's all about who gets the front seat and who gets the back seat. So she, she, uh, you know, she opened the door and asked, 
where uh, I was headed. I mean, it says Stanford right on there, the sign they were holding up. And I said, I'm going to Palo Alto. I can drop you off. Oh, great. And she jumps in, grabs her stuff, jumps in, opens the back seat up for her friend, who's standing there looking at me long and serious about whether or not, because I could tell at the time, she knows better than to get in. Single adult. It's a coupe instead of a four-door car, so she cannot get out other than through the front seat. Coupe? So that's all the warning signs of not getting in with a single, you know, in that kind of a situation. Uh, all of the things were wrong about it. But when I drove up, I pulled that little stunt of looking at my watch. You know, do I have time to pick them up? And you wouldn't believe how much effect that kind of thing has. And when she kept staring at me and looking, looking for something wrong in my eyes, I gave this look back like, I don't understand. Why, why are you looking at me like this? I gave her that back, and she says, oh, this guy's a dork. He's innocent as hell. She gets in. Okay. We're driving along, and I'm looking at this young lady in the rearview mirror. And I look back at it years later, and I'm saying, she kept looking me back, too, right in the eyeballs. I'm wearing dark glasses, but they're not totally dark. And I'm realizing now that she could see me looking at her, and she was looking right back at me. And instead of saying something to me, like, what are you looking at, or, hey, maybe you ought to drop us off, or something like that, she just kept looking back at me. And I'm looking at her, and she keeps looking at me. I'm thinking she's playing this little game. It's, uh, it's not really teasing so to speak. It's just this little psychological game back and forth that men and women do sometimes. The young girl in the front, uh, Anita, was uh, at one... Uh, at first I did, yeah, but that stopped. Wait, because that? at first I was hoping I could get off, I could get a vicarious thrill out of seeing those pictures and say, well, this will be satisfying enough. One, two people die, that's it. It doesn't have to go past that. And I'll see why I don't want to do it again. Those pictures lasted about two weeks. And I come back from work two days after I did it. I mean, Tuesday, right? Sunday it happened. Monday I took off, took CTO, uh, compensatory time off, and I go back to work Tuesday. I come home from work Tuesday, a hard day at work. I'm feeling like I used to feel. I've done some work that day. I've accomplished something. And I'm saying, I can't believe I did this stuff. I must have dreamed it. This must be some kind of weird dream. And I come back to the house, I pick up the corner of the carpet, I pull out these pictures and I, in an envelope, and I say, geez, I don't believe this. Now i got to believe it. That really happened. Hmm. See, I was that distanced from what I had done just okay. one day later Interesting. that I couldn't believe, or two physical days later, that I couldn't believe that I'd actually done that. After two weeks, I couldn't handle the reality of those pictures. Now, I've seen, I've read where guys have hung criminals, like in the Old West, and tanned the guy's hide and made a pair of shoes out of it. The doctor did, the city doctor, and took his skull and made an inkwell out of it with gold hinges on it for the pens. This was some notorious criminal, right? I said, gee, that's kind of grisly. Why did you take care of the dead body? Was it a kind of way to replace the sexual experience? I think so. I think so. It was a, I think so, and it was a, like a trophy thing. It was, uh, it's disgusting, but it was a, kind of a power trip. Uh, I always felt intimidated by women. I always felt overpowered by them as a kid. When I stopped making it yeah. as an adult, when I, I was doing great socially on the job base. See, I think it's more about he hates women, you know? Not that it was his mom. You know, you could say, well, why does he hate women? Yeah, because he's probably just, uh, you know, it reminds me a little bit of that one guy that we were talking about a few weeks back. Uh, with the two first names, what's his name again? Uh, what was that guy's name? That he was like an insul. He killed his, um, you know, like six people that one day. He has two first names, like Mar. Uh, yeah, there it is, Elliot Roger. Thank you. Yeah, Elliot Roger. It's not Rogers even. It's just Ro Elliot Roger. So, yeah, it's a little bit like that. He hated women. He always got angry that other people got to have women. I think he's more like that. Making friends locally, having buddies and stuff, and, you know, have a pizza and a beer and stuff. No problem. I got friends for that. But making women friends was real tough. And battling my mom on the one hand and trying to make friends with women is a little bit of a problem because there was a lot of crossover there. Yeah, he made a bunch of and videos. she was opening a lot of old wounds, pushing a lot of buttons, and she liked to watch me twitch. That's the only thing I can say. There was a little bit of sadism in her, too. 
And I hated her for that because she was the one person in the world that could push every button I had because she knew where they all were. And as I got better and smarter and, and, and better at what I did and, you know, more involved in the public and, and uh, let's say, a better all-around adult, it's as if she were offended by that. And they, you may ask why, okay? Just look at the vanity of being a mother. She raised me, had a horrible time from day one as an individual parent raising me. Uh, fight every day, right? The state comes in. She's a proud woman. She's a, a vain woman. She was real proud, and I'm, she was raised that way. The state of California takes her son away from her and says, we are taking your son away because you must be an unfit mother. He's a murderer. He killed people. I'm trying to look at it from her point of view. If you could raise your son right, you wouldn't kill people, lady. We're taking him. And in a mere five and a half years of bureaucracy and she had nothing she had no respect for california bureaucracy she used to make jokes about that all the time about if you want you know if you want to waste the rest of your life doing nothing apply for something and you know through a bureaucratic process in california those bureaucrats took me away from her and in five and a half years of filter farbing around they hand me back and now i'm an overachiever huh good looking strapping young man wants to go work, wants to make a living for himself, wants to be sociable, he isn't paranoid and pulling away from people anymore. That shocked the hell out of her. It had to have. She didn't share that with me, but I'm saying that must have really tore at her and made her feel all the more a bad mother. So instead of, I have a feeling she felt she couldn't be a part of that healing process, so she attacked it because I became a cancer in her life. I reminded her every day what a rotten mother she must be, <laughs> and I'm not saying she was. She must be a rotten mother. Look what the state did for me, and she couldn't. They couldn't have insulted her any worse if they'd have tried, and they didn't try. They were trying to solve a problem by paroling me to her, so I'll stay out of trouble and go be a good adult and pay taxes. And guess what? That's the one furnace they should not have put me back in because, hey, she had no help on the other end to sort through her feelings, and she was too proud to get help. So we fought, and we fought, and that's the only excuse I can make in my head. She's not here to discuss it. That's the only thing I can, the balance I can put in there is that I must have been a terrible accuser to her, a terrible accusal of what a rotten mother she was or she could have done better. Even the state raised me with apparent ease. They locked me away in an adult institution where I should have been raped and I should have been mutilated and I should have been screwed over and been a, like Charlie Manson when he was raped as a kid in prison in youth authority. You know? And then he starts raping other people and he's a leader of that stuff and then he's manipulating people. I'm an American, and I went off the deep end. So here's, uh, there's a little bit of footage from when he was on trial, too, really quick. That's actually, look at him in court there. What a gomer. <laughs> Got him. I'd show you that out of, out of sequence. Let's see what this one says. Up to being a victim. He's going to have to be one. With an IQ of 136, Kemper is now the prison's best reader of books for the blind. Wow. Saying I wanted to kill. He was released to the one person that authorities at the state mental hospital recommended he never see again. I got paroled to my mother. Atascadero decided that I didn't, I didn't ever need to talk to her again at all. Don't give her a Christmas present. Leave her alone. She got her pound of flesh out of you. I wasn't Thanks, sniveling about my mother to them. I didn't like to hear what they had to say about her. She went through three husbands like a hot knife through butter. When Four months after I was out, I was back into the fantasy bag. My first date was an absolute disaster. It wasn't her fault. You know? 
And I didn't blame her even then. I'm saying it was a terrible tragedy, but boy, was it, boy, she didn't ever talk to me again. It was awful. It wasn't sexual or grabbing at her or nothing. I was just such a dork taking her to a John Wayne movie and uh, dork. Denny. <laughs> dork. It's perfect. It's terrible. I'd never been on a date. At 16, that was cool, you know? I'd never been on a date, you know? I was locked up since I was 15. But I can't tell her that. Oh, gee, you don't mind me. You know, she kind of got a, hung up on my looks or whatever. You know, I mean, she's a gorgeous young lady pure class and she saw something there that I guess wasn't there and boy she found out quick. Taking elaborate precautions he drove around universities and picked up hitchhiking co-eds while wearing these glasses. Yeah. These are the ones. Wow he actually. Now would you get in the car with this man? Huh? Oh so he did this all intentionally. Oh yeah. Yeah see. Hmm? It's true, right? I mean, State look has at made that. me much more credible as a human being. While his mother worked at the university, God, Kemper right buried there. the mutilated bodies in the mountains. Man, that's some weird shit right there. It's <laughs> while wearing these glasses. Yeah. These are the ones. And they would, right? Those glasses would be a little now, different. Would you get in the car with this man? Huh? He's not a serial mm -hmm. killer. That's crazy. State has made me much more credible as a human being. While his mother worked at the university, Kemper buried the mutilated bodies in the mountains and took the severed heads home. Then he slept with their heads for days and finally went looking for more. But I was losing a grasp on something that yeah, was too violent to keep nuts. inside forever. As I'm sitting there with a severed head in my hand, talking to it, or looking at it, and I'm about to go crazy, literally. I'm about to go completely flywheel loose and just fall apart. I say, wow, this is insane. And then I told myself, no, it isn't. You're saying that, and that makes it not insane. I said, I'm sane, and I'm looking at a seven. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I see old ink paints, paintings and drawings of Viking heroes talking to severed heads and taking them to parties, old enemies and leather bags, part of our heritage. This is me back then, in 1972 and 73. Unable to live with the fact that I just stabbed to death and cut the throat of an innocent young woman. Innocent in the sense that she did not plan on that happening. She didn't do anything specifically for that to happen to no, her. No, she was innocent all around. She was a very active participant no in her own death. There's no sense that in this sense. And in my memory of that, she was 19 years old, and her roommate in the trunk who died right, right after that was... See, what he's implying there is that no women are innocent. But she was innocent in this way. You see what I'm saying? Like, like, just listen to that part again. Unable to live with the fact that I just stabbed to death and cut the throat of an innocent young woman. Innocent in the sense that she did not plan on that happening. She didn't do anything specifically for that to happen to her. Right, see? So what he's really saying is nobody's innocent, but for the sake of... Uh, no women are innocent, but for the sake of this, it's this is the specific reason that I'm telling you that she was just walking around and that she was a very active participant in her own death oh, and in my memory of that she was 19 years old and her roommate in the trunk who died right after that was 18 I didn't go hog wild and totally limp what I'm saying is I found myself doing things in an attempt to make things fit together inside. I was doing sexual probings and things I mean in the sense of striking out and reaching out and grabbing and pulling to me but appalled at the sense that it wasn't working. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. It isn't the way I want it. See what I'm saying? And yet I get, during that time, <laughs> I become I'm engaged <laughs> to someone who's young and is beautiful and very much the same advantage. At least I say, you know what I'm saying? Same upbringing. <laughs> see, I say, you know what I'm saying? At least I don't say, see what I'm saying? Because he said that kind of the way I say that. Oh, God. Man, are you kidding me? In an attempt to make things fit together inside. I was doing sexual probings and things. I mean, in the sense of striking out and reaching out and grabbing and pulling to me, but appalled at the sense that it wasn't working. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. It isn't the way I want it. See what I'm saying? <laughs> and that I get, during that time, See I become I'm engaged saying? to someone who's young and is beautiful and very much the same advantages and you know very, what I'm very talking much about? the same upbringing and Disneyland values. And, uh, She's very much the reason I surrendered. I know. I, I said the name of it 50 times, K-Dog and Zozo. Like 40 times when I was doing the show, 
I told you what it was called. I even said it out loud. Man, you guys, do you guys ever even watch the show, like the whole shows? I picked up two girls who were so much like the first two, it was unbelievable. Almost identical circumstances. And I let them go. Everything went towards killing them, and I didn't. But I'm saying, wow, it's uncanny. It was almost like it was meant to be that way. And I said, wow, I've got, this got to stop. And I let them out. They never even knew what was going on. I let them out. I would have gotten away with those two being murdered. I said, no, it's got to stop. And a week later, I murdered my mother. Went back to Santa Cruz and killed her. He killed her with a hammer in her sleep. A claw Cut hammer. off her head and hands. But then put her vocal cords in the garbage disposal and threw darts at her severed head. We are going to bring our cameras into his Cali So what about this one? This is one that's similar to the Dahmer deal where they're all uh, talking about, you know how Dahmer, I mean, look, look at this. Kemper right here talks about how he's now religious. <laughs> and Dahmer did that on the Stone Phillips interview. You guys got to go watch that one. It's like their technique, you know. I, I look at See, that's one of the things I don't like about, like, uh, like, you know, born again type, you know, Christianity, where it's, uh, if, as long as you accept Jesus, you do not go to hell, right? So, but here's the thing: I think if there was a God out there that sends people to hell, I wouldn't give. He wouldn't give two shits what Dahmer or what uh, Kemper said. Oh yes, I'm now accept really. Um, if you're going to send somebody to heaven, if they're, you know, if that's a real thing, because you just accepted Jesus, even though you had sex with heads of people, then that's not a God that I, I would want to have anything to do with. That's the most unjust bullshit I've ever heard in my life. Uh, he is so, a anyway. man at peace, transformed. Oh, here he is. He's transformed, everybody. Join me as we hear from Ed Kemper and meet him face to face and you be the judge oh i'll be the i'm already the judge I don't need to... oh man i thought those were like the dials on an electric chair well of course though, though. that's why they do it. <laughs> thank you ed for talking with us today how long have you been in prison 17 years did you believe in God when you first came to prison? When I first came to prison, I had been a baptized Christian, a fundamentalist uh, Protestant Christian on the streets uh, some years before. And I got caught up in a lot of... Yeah, like I tell you guys, I mean, I don't even think we should have prisons anymore. You know, we just take in a killer and just say, here's a Bible, let's call it a day. They go home, read it. They promise to read it, and we are, we're all good now. No more prisons. How's that sound? Trinkets, a lot of flashy things, uh, involvements that were not Christian, that were not wholesome. And I completely fell away from my faith and from my devotion to Christ. When I came to prison, there was a lot of distraction in here, too. But also, there was a lot of time to contemplate, a lot of time to think about all the damage that had happened to me and people around me because of my attitude, because of life out there, distractions out there, and not facing up to some real problems I needed to deal with. As you know, much has been written about you. When you first came to prison, you were described as a monster, a maniac. How different is the Ed Kemper before our camera today? Um, Yeah. It's so let me just let's just say this: Gandhi he went to hell and Kemper went to heaven, or was going to heaven because he's still alive. Possible for people to be more relaxed with me than with some other people. Um, it might well be thought to be an uptight situation. I'm a very large person, six foot nine, weigh about 350 pounds, yeah. and you would think someone that large is going to be prone toward violence and aggression and uh, overbearing yeah, you, you personality. Are, so. And I'm working toward quite the opposite. So I'd, I would say <laughs> the difference between 16, working. 17 years ago where I was considered friendly and easygoing person, that was a facade. Now it's real. 
Are you concerned about what people on the street think? He's been in prison for 47 years. People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... See, this part right here, uh, it's really strange. So, is this one of those moments where he's trying to talk to that other voice? See what? I would say the difference between 16, 17 years ago where I was considered friendly, an easygoing person, that was a facade. Now it's real. So here comes this question. Are you concerned about what people on the street think of you? People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... You know, what? I, I, to me, here, here's what I think is happening right here. Is he screwed up in his answer? He, he was trying to have this really, you know, smart sounding answer, but it didn't even make any sense. So then he goes, you know, and then he makes it seem like he's talking to somebody else, and the guy rephrases the question, but it, I don't, I, I think they edited it because it's not even close to the same question. Repeat it at least once, come on. Who's he talking about? Repeat it at least once, come on. Is he talking to his inner voice on how to say something? What, what is he doing right there? And so now it looks like this guy's going to rephrase it, but he doesn't say anything close to that. Let, let, let me rephrase that. From your early childhood and a mother who at the very least mentally abused you, to the victim's families who... What he said first was, I think they completely edited this to make it look like that's what he was referring to. This is a whole different part of a conversation here. Because it doesn't make any sense at all. He had asked him, what do people... What do you think of the how people think of you out on the streets? This has nothing to do with that. I think they just edited it here. I think he was having a weird moment where he was talking to himself... This guy who's trying to sell a narrative of some religious, you know, atonement crap um, wanted to edit that out, so he took another part where he wanted to rephrase and put that in there. Okay, let's just play it again and you, you see what I'm talking about here. I would say the difference between 16, 17 years ago where I was considered friendly and easygoing person, that was a facade. Now it's real. Are you concerned about what people on the street think of you? People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... Okay, what, what would that mean right there? People on the streets that could be a, bait, a great benefit to the... Well, no, he said, what do you think... So he was screwing up in his answer. Now he's going to pretend that there was this other voice that he needed to get the answer from. And then they edited that shit out and then put this other one back in. Just Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? When that large is... Who cares, Scooby? That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I'm going to be prone toward violence and aggression and uh, overbearing personality. And I'm working toward quite the opposite. So I'd, I would say the difference between 16, 17 years yeah, ago... Yeah, nothing, because he was screwing up on what he's saying. An easygoing person. That was a facade. What do you mean? You don't understand what I'm saying, Meep Meep? You're, are you confused? Or seems pretty simple. They he asks them a question. You know, what do you think other people think about you out on the streets? Then he answered, and he screwed up in his answer because it made no sense at all. And then he pretends that this inner voice needs to repeat it again, so he can say it right. And then that was so crazy that they edited it to a different, because the question he asks again uh, is absolutely, you know, not rephrasing anything close to what do you think people out on the street think of you? Uh, now it's real. Watch. Are you concerned about what people on the street think of you? Yeah. People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... Where's that inner voice? Inner voice. Where is it? Repeat it at least once. Come on. 
let, let me rephrase that. From your early childhood and a mother who at the very least mentally abused you, to the victim's families who in some instances have hated you, how do you deal with all this negativity? That's one thing that those emotions yeah, I mean, I being spent sort on the of related. brings I don't know. to the fore is the, whether you have an ability to deal with it He was talking not. about people out in the streets. If you don't, you learn one or you fall because it's a real trap. Yeah, Hatred, uh, a little different. Revenge, but I don't vengeance, know. Maybe... Uh, retribution. You know, maybe he's looking at him on a ca like a little camera monitor and they're not in the same room somewhere. It's interesting how often people say that know. that's the Greek way. They put some class to it and say... That's a classic Greek uh, statement. That uh, at least with the revenge, so. there's some kind of solace. And I don't really he believe knew what that. the question cop out. And it's easy for me to say that being a violent criminal in, in my past. I don't think so. But I haven't had to deal with feelings directly related to murder, to retribution, to forgiveness in all of my life until I became this, until I lived this for 17 solid years. In fact. 22 out of the last 25 years and uh, I'm in for life I'm doing life I'm not satisfied with that I accept it it's something that took a long time to accept and I'm not serving a sentence but I'm not trying to beat anyone oh, I just realized meep meep that's the sound that the roadrunner makes right <laughs> meep meep went out of the retribution I'm living a life I won't waste a life again you came to Christ at the point you accepted responsibility for all the murders. Yet I understand it happened in an unlikely place. Where was that? Yes, I was sitting on a toilet and... Uh... In the hole, doing time in the lockup. Um, I could just squander my life away, waste it away to, to nothing, quietly die in a little corner, or start living my life. And it was over a period of months that was very ugly. It's the worst place I've ever lived in my life, and it's the best place I've ever lived. Because during that three years there, I came to grips with myself, with my feelings, with who I was. I became a human being for the first time in my life, instead of a caricature. What would your life be like without Jesus Christ? If Christ were not in my life now, if peace were not in my life, if love were not in my life, this I'd probably sick. be dead. If I weren't, I'd be wishing I was dead. Although you will probably never be released, you once told me that if you got out, you'd go far away. Oh, I know he would. Yeah, you get the hell There's out of There's a lot of missionary work out there. And a lot of people in the world that don't know Christ and won't know Christ unless people lay down the comforts and the fun things, the fast cars and nifty watches and the cute girlfriends and the telephones and go somewhere where the mosquitoes are as big as hummingbirds and the alligators bite and uh, share the word. And share the oh, peace. share the word. Okay. Ask them to exchange okay, yeah. ritual and <laughs> tradition. I don't and think history so, buddy. For something That's that works with other people. I understand that part of what helped you dedicate your life to Christ was the faithfulness of a Christian volunteer who visited you through a prison ministry called M2. Tell us about that. The uh, people close to me, family members and uh, close friends, drifted away over the years. They had other things to do than to drag into prison continually. So for a period of time, I had very few or no visits at all from the outside. And the way I learned about Match 2 was by word of mouth. I knew a few people involved with it here and had seen a few in the visiting room earlier in the years. So I got an application, filled it out, and talked to one of the representatives from the outside, came in to see me. And one thing that was remarkable about that, and it's remained that way since, a remarkable thing is that that man came to my housing unit, to my wing, to my cell, to talk to me. And the notice I got of that meeting said, please be on your wing at your house. See, people familiar with the nomenclature in here, we don't like to call it a cell. It isn't a cell, it's our house, it's where we live. It's not where we do time where we live our lives and that's rather than sensitive to reality I'd like to think that that's dealing with reality we're either serving time or we're living our lives and you either do it wastefully or you do it usefully the man wanted to come see me in my house and for a civilian to come inside and to come right in where we live was meaningful to me it meant quite a bit that touched me as very sincere and I've known the man some years now <laughs> and Okay. It's, uh, get him, get him. That's never wavered. <laughs>
It sounds like the faithfulness of this Christian man had a great impact on you. Oh, my yes. match to oh. sponsors. Very he was short fantastic. He's not even average in height. He's very slender. He's a businessman. And this is just all propaganda bull crap. Like he just wanted to make it seem like we can even help serial killers. I mean, we are. Give me a break. Not at all imposing. And Couldn't they have picked another serial killer? I mean, at least I mean this guy's articulate, but he was, you know, having sex with dead, um, decapitated bodies, and then the head too. And this is the one that you're gonna pick to show that he's on his way to redemption. I mean, give me a break, man. We get along quite well, um, very well, in fact. He's a very dear friend of mine. After just a few months. The man is sincere, he's honest, he cares, and he's here to learn too. It started out a bit shaky because he was scared. This is prison. It was his first prison. I was his first matchup. And I'm a no court, notorious criminal. People talk about monster this and maniac that. No, oh, yeah. That's, what is the most difficult aspect of your incarceration? It's hard to answer. Yeah, what it not is. Not being able to chop people up. And... I've lost the most, I'd say, lost touch with where I would have been, or might have been, had I still been in society those 17 years. And what would that have been? Have there been times of deep bad? sadness, even desperation? It had been a rat race, it's, which I guess is uh, an overused term, but that's what it felt like to me, like a big race, and all of a sudden it come to a screeching halt, and I was just standing there. And I didn't have any reason to live. I was wavering between suicide and trying not to be violent again, and it was a very violent atmosphere I was in, down in, in, the, uh, in the hole. Mm. And the violence down there is like 65% higher than it is on the main line of a prison, so it's hard to avoid that. And it's so easy to fall into the suicidal trip that uh, it's scary. How do you survive? Two ways, with Christ and without. Uh, when I first came to prison, didn't it make I you sick hearing him even saying that you know, Christ at and all? Yeah. First three years in prison were in what we call the hole in the uh, adjustment center in the prison. I mean, you, even if you're not religious, it sounds. I shitty. spent probably the first year of that in what I saw as the blackest pit of my life. Uh, the state. I think you're right, beholder. A little concrete room. I had oh, a garment to type to keep just kidding. Freezing, I knew that you were some food to keep from starving, a place to deposit it when I was done with it. And that was it. And I was told that's what I needed to live. And I guess the most shocking thing was all my life, being especially a California person, I'd been listening to uh, media conversation about you need this, you have to have that. You just can't live without this product or this item or this Must see system. TV. I'd heard that all my life and now I sat in a little concrete room and I was told by people that were in authority that that's all I needed to stay alive. And what I found myself doing was facing myself for the first time in my life. And at that time I was 24 years old. Do you have many opportunities to share your faith in Christ with the other inmates? Yes, I'm able to share Christ in here in prison with other people, um, both other Christians and people who feel pain when the issue of Christ comes up, when the issue of mercy and love comes up, because <laughs> mercy and it's love. like a scalding. Are you kidding people me? People have pain, they have scars, they have bitterness. I think this is a parody of some sort, don't you? Mercy and love. Yeah, something you're very familiar with. They don't have ways of resolving that. And to see someone come by with a smile on his face and with peace in his heart, and that radiates, that's painful. And those people tend to be violent or aggressive toward that kind of, uh, that kind of an involvement. So if what you're going you to be about? a Christian and a genuine one, it's a burden. It's a cross, and that's the cross Christ asks us to bear, is uh, the ridicule or the tempting of other people uh, to sway away from what we've been Listen doing. that music they and put in there. rather than try to justify my involvement with, oh Christ my God, with you... Christianity, um, I'd like to see it as a contest. Saint Kemper! <laughs> That's what... And I think, I, I've learned in the past that, uh, 
with the patience of Christ. My God, are you patience kidding? of that love. Oh wow. Okay, that's that's unreal. Mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs. Their picture window open, the curtains open. Eleven o'clock at night, the lights are on. All they there have to is. do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you cut them off? And why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Uh, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, that you get it, everybody! God, what a clown. Well, I don't think it was. Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. I got on my bike and I rode I tried to stop it. I remember that. I got on the bike, rode around the block. Mm -hmm. I was crying. I haven't talked about that for a lot of years. But did it I'm taste sure good? Was it lemon that pepper may have or something? That may have gotten some sort of a saute with garlic sauce. Lines, but it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in one minute, have someone's head in your hands? And very shortly living thereafter. Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that severed head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away, and th there'd be a knock on the door, and I'd put it away and answer the door. And the landlady would be there, and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality, not mine. Some people go crazy means. at that point. I felt it. It was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it. Walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me. God, how crazy by. is that? Huh? Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent that that really, I could feel the wheels squeaking inside. That was really pulling on it. And I imagine at that point some people break. But I didn't literally go insane. I didn't get lost. And all this time, Kemper was able to seem normal. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships but that was I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information but there were some things that were bothering me like were there any speculations on how they were dying did the cops like you like I said a friendly nuisance I got in the way and it was deliberate again friendly nuisances are dismissed how did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police watching television Believe it or not, <laughs> Joseph Wambaugh, a police story. Got some tremendous insights into it. not just the gimmicks, yeah. the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a uh, memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources right. for clues. Right, and you're 6'9", you'd stand Tracking down. down the attenders. Take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate his potential suspects. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted man. He came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. He crossed back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, 
We walk into the house wow. to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes. And it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic, or the 44 Magnum. And I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, a 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, Phew, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I had forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet door is yeah. open, and That's I have so a high-powered rifle a with a scope on it. You had some other stuff in the house, too, yes? Yeah. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before, right next to the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No, but when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered so and instantly he responds to what I'm saying my hand moves back we go outside and he's still thinking boy this is a really nice and helpful guy here uh, some of these people uh, do what you and I do to become better killers they practice their trade yeah well, anyways you guys I think that's gonna be it you can I, I have the links in the description you can go watch all these but uh, pretty crazy case huh <clears throat> so I hope that was uh, an interesting Serial Killer Sunday show with the Edmund Kemper, the absolute whack job, gigantic barbarian. All right, but he's an interesting uh, killer for sure because he's he's so uh, articulate when he's explaining things. You know, it's just uh, interesting. Yeah, I guess Bundy would be a little bit like that, and so is uh, Dahmer. You know, so Dahmer, you gotta go watch the the Stone Phillips interview with uh, Dahmer. I'm sure I'll end up doing him one of these days. Not sure though. All right, you guys. Well, I appreciate you guys coming here, and thank you for all the uh, super chats and whatnot. see oh and also uh, PayPal from Charles and Amy she sent me one earlier too so thank you there it is that's the house right there So thank you to LM, Amanda Locklear, D. Lambo, J. Case, two times in a row, Cat Eye, one of them, Miss Katja Moneypenny, LM, Miss Katja Moneypenny again, Janice Johnson, Pebs, Emily Flotilla, Matt Bavia, Amy Celeste, Perry Mom, Your Gypsy, classical guitarist, uh, Emily Flotilla, Nicole Wilson, Apocalypse Fra, Kelly B, Linda Howell, Nicole Wilson, Emily Flotilla, Perry Mom, Nicole Wilson again, thank you, uh, Kathy Frydenmaker, Apocalypse Fra, Lori Fisher, Emily Flotilla, Living It, uh, Candy, Candy Lee, Woodward Stone, Jessica Schubach, and Allie Cake, and uh, Perry Mom was also a cat eye donation, thank you very much. I think there was another one in there, too. Yeah, Quietly Frozen was um, also a cat eye donation. So thank you. And thank you for anybody who became a channel member. 
Appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to go watch myself some Walking Dead. All right, you guys? <laughs> so I don't think I'm going to do a, a post Mary Lou type thing or anything like that. But I ah, need to go get some rest. All right, you guys. Thank you very much. I hope you, uh, you know, enjoyed the show as well as you can when you're talking about a serial killer. But uh, pretty crazy. Went through all the newspaper, everything. Hopefully... The whole case, you know, I'm sure there's some little nuanced details here, here and there, but I think uh, you got a kind of a picture of how it all went down over all the years. Okay, so we'll be doing another one next Sunday. Whatever killer that will be, I don't know. All right, so that's it, everybody. Thank you very much. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person. Okay, great, you go short one. Crime decision. Thanks, great, thanks, great. Quick rejector. I'm no a certified problem, Mary Lou. Lou. lie detector. Gonna get ya. On a stretcher. If you try and play me like an old, old projector. projector. Crime sector. Is my neck ever had a great is gonna give another lecture? Crime collector. Get right back to work. All right, everybody. Talk to you. All right, Chris. Thanks, man. That Ed Kemper, he was a bad dude, wasn't he? Bad dude, yeah. No, he was a barbarian. Okay, well, same thing. No, bad dude's bad dude, and barbarian is a barbarian. Okay, great, gee. <laughs> All right, you guys. See you guys tomorrow. And as I always say, be safe out there. Oh, don't hitchhike, okay, for God's sakes.